What's up guys Chaos Shinobi here. This is what if Naruto has the mutated Hyotan. Summary, what if Haku bestowed his bloodline to the person he felt the closest connection to? What if the side effect of the transfer caused Haku to awaken inside Naruto's mindscape? How would the child of prophesied destiny be affected by this turn of events? Chapter 1 For the sake of my precious person, my name is Uzumaki Naruto, but some people know me simply as the QB brat, demon brat, or just plain demon or plain QB. A lot has happened in the short time since I became a Janan. I fought against the demon of the mist Momochi Zabuza and his incredibly smart and talented apprentice, Yuki Haku. I also entered the Chunin exams with my team and made it to the finals before our village was invaded, giving me a glimpse into the horrors of war and the burden that one carries as a Hokage, as the Hokage damned himself and his predecessors to eternal suffering in the Death God's stomach, all for the sake of the village. Following that, I was attacked by an organization of S-ranked shinobi hell-bent on capturing and ultimately killing me and then what I thought to be my best friend betrayed the village and joined the very enemy that orchestrated the attack on our village and killed the Hokage. I can't count the number of times I almost died in that retrieval mission alone. All in all, one could say that I am a very experienced shinobi for one so young and new in the shinobi forces. I've experienced almost everything. However, there is one important event that perhaps trumps all other experiences that I've had before. It happened when I lost consciousness in my battle with Sasuke, a battle in which I was ultimately defeated. I ended up drifting into the sewer that is my mindscape but rather than the usual meeting with the fox that always followed this event, I instead came across another being in my mindscape, an actual human being, yes, the one and only Momochi Yukihaku. I couldn't believe what I was seeing with my own two eyes. At first I thought it was a dream but I was proven wrong almost immediately as Haku explained everything to me. Apparently this happened when I was unconscious and Sasuke tried to protect me from Haku's onslaught. Haku had managed to lay a hand on me, and in that moment he had placed a forbidden jutsu on me that he had originally intended to use on his master, Momochi Zabuza. He said that he'd had an epithemi, that he'd not only seen a potential for greatness in me, but had foreseen his and Zabuza's death too, partly because he couldn't imagine himself taking my life and also because he'd sensed the presence of the QB inside of me. He also explained that he wasn't even sure that Zabuza could survive the jutsu but he had known because of my Uzumaki heritage and because of the QB that I would survive the jutsu. It was a sealing jutsu that sealed a great amount of his chakra and life force into another, and the chakra would restructure the target's body and chakra network at a molecular level in order to make said target compatible with his Kekagan K. Naturally, I was more than a little shocked. I couldn't believe that Haku would create such a crazy technique, and I couldn't comprehend why he would either. He told me that that he'd created the jutsu because he was unable to be of proper use to Zabuza, that, in the event that either Zabuza got fed up with his failures or that he was prepared to die, then he would use the jutsu to pass his kekagen on onto Zabuza before he dies. This way, he would always be part of Zabuza and he would be eternally useful to his master, ultimately becoming what he was truly meant to be in the truest sense of the word that being Zabuza's ultimate weapon. It broke my heart to hear those words from Haku, but at the time, I had too many questions to dwell on that. I needed answers. Why wasn't I aware of this earlier, and why did Haku wait until now to explain the situation? But Haku explained that there were unforeseen circumstances. He explained that he didn't expect the side effect of him regaining consciousness within my mindscape, and that my mind, as a Jinchuriki, was far more complex compared to that of a normal human being and hence why this happened. But he said that he considered it to be a good side effect because it enabled him to not only actively control the assimilation, but also to slow it down to a level where the assimilation would take place discreetly and without any pain or suffering on my part. This was important because if I ended up in the hospital, even for a few hours, they would probably do tests and figure out what was happening, and if that happened and people found out that an enemy shinobi had practically taken over my body, then I would become even more of a pariah in Konoha and no one would ever trust me enough to approve me as the Hokage. I have to admit that, had this been anyone else, literally anyone else but my closest friend in the world, I too would have been worried. Technically speaking, Haku was in a position now where he could mount a strong challenge for possession of my body, he was in fact in a far better position than even QB because there was no seal or cage restricting him and he even told me he had spent most of that time exploring every aspect of my mindscape and analyzing my body in order to find the, in his opinion, many secrets hidden inside of it. This knowledge would come in handy when we began our training together, but it could have turned out oh so differently had Haku not been who he is. Anyway, Haku did suggest that we join the ANBU, and more specifically, the Hunter Nin division of the ANBU he explained that as Hokage. I would need to have in-depth knowledge of all the divisions in the village and that joining the Anbu was the easiest method to grasp everything. Also, 
He explained that I needed to see and experience the true extent of the darkness of the world in order to make the world a better place. It also helped that the Anbu would teach me discipline and standard protocol and also entrench the fundamentals of being a shinobi into me. Then there was the ninjutsu side of things. Hako told me that the Anbu library in every ninja village has a vast array of ninjutsu scrolls both from within the village and that which were spoils of war confiscated from enemy shinobi. This would be useful for our ninjutsu training. Haku had mastered every single water jutsu that Zabuzo had and he had mastered Fuuten manipulation along with his Kekegenkei, but he didn't know any actual Fuuten techniques and the many Hyotan techniques he knew were his own creations. Perhaps we could find some Fuuten techniques inside Anbu headquarters in order to diversify my ninjutsu arsenal he suggested. It certainly sounded like an incredible idea to me, although my weakness for ninjutsu might have played a part in shaping my opinion. Anyway, last but not least. Joining the Anbu would make it easier for me to hide from Akatsuki until I was ready to take on them and being a hunter nin would ensure that I not only got battle experience but also acquired the knowledge and skill required to track Sasuke down and bring him back to the village. Needless to say, the argument he presented was more than a little compelling, I almost immediately rushed to Tsunade's office and demanded entry into the Anbu ranks. She flatly refused me off course and said I didn't know what I was saying. Haku guided me through the details though as I explained everything he'd said to me thoroughly, leaving out a few secrets off course. When asked how I knew I had a wind and water affinity, I simply gave the chakra paper explanation that Haku told me, even though I had no idea what the hell that was at the time. I finally got both Tsunade and Shizune-chan's attention after that, I could tell that they were shocked by my, or rather, Haku's reasoning. I even pleaded that they didn't tell any of my comrades where I was that they just release information that I had gone on a long-term mission or something. It would be easier if everyone genuinely believed that I was gone, and they themselves would be more convincing if they encountered an enemy looking for me. Things degenerated when Tsunade still refused my appeal. She cited the fact that Jiraiya wanted to take me on a three-year training trip and that she had already given him express permission. I implored her to reverse her decision, training under Jiraiya, when he actually did pay attention to me would be undoubtedly useful and educational I had to admit but he spent so much time doing his research, managing his spy network, or just plain drinking and hanging out with prostitutes and girls that I just felt that the experience would not be enough to get me where I wanted to be. The lack of battle experience also didn't sit well with me, and Haku also agreed with my sentiments. However, he did come up with a compromise, one that would somewhat appease Tsunade. Haku pointed out that Tsunade, as Hokage, could simply order that Jiraiya Sensei spend two weeks straight in Konoha once every three months. And even if that wasn't made in order, Jiraiya Sensei could still come to Konoha of his own accord for at least a total 8 weeks in the 50 to 52 weeks that made up a year, that is, if he truly considered me as his apprentice. We had the advantage at this point in time, Shizune Chan and Tsunade Ba could not refute my argument and they had no valid grounds to deny me this request. That's not to say that Tsunade didn't try, because she did, using her council of advisors as a smokescreen for her decision to turn me down, but I wasn't about to fall for that for I already knew that those old farts would never deny my request, they'd wanted me in the Anbu since I was 4 years old, they'd be happier than even I was about my decision to join. In the end, Tsunade ended up giving me a condition. It was a rule that no one below the level of Chunin was permitted to join the Anbu even though the Hokage had the discretion to make exceptions. Still, she argued that even a Hokage's discretionary limits could only extend so far and she had already stretched the limits on too many occasions already. Instead. She wanted me to prove to her that I could fight at the level of a Chunin without using the fox's chakra. So it was decided that I would be promoted to Chunin if I passed a handwritten test and impressed her in battle without relying on the fox. It was also stipulated that a third test would be held after both those tests, a test to see if I could guarantee that I won't go berserk when I use the fox's chakra. Jiraiya Sensei was supposed to come for me in four months' time, and I had that long to improve my skills and the test would be taken on his return. If I passed the test then I would be allowed to have my way. If I failed then I would have no choice but to go with Jiraiya Sensei. Haku and I agreed to the terms and we have spent all the time and training and learning as much as we can, with Haku as my mentor. I started training with Gai San and Lee to improve speed, stamina, strength, and quality of my taijutsu. Of course, I was excluded when Gai wanted to teach Lee some of his own personal moves, but I was always included for speed, stamina, and strength training and both Lee and Guy gave me tips here and there to help me improve my basic understanding and use of Taijutsu. I would go on to train with Guy Sensei and Lee for the remainder of the four-month program. When I wasn't training with Guy San and Lee, Haku would be training me to move stealthily, to move swiftly, and he would also help me further improve my speed, agility, flexibility, 
and evasive tactics. This is all I did for four months, and I was pushed far beyond my limits by both Guy Sensei and Haku, Guy Sensei because he was a training and fitness nut job, and Haku because he actually studied my body and knew that I should be able to handle far more punishment than the average human. Even though this is all I had time for in 24 hours that make up a day, that's not to say that is all I did, far from it actually. Haku discovered something about my shadow clones that I had absolutely and completely taken for granted. He pointed out how I remembered and felt the experiences of my clones as if I had been the one partaking in the tasks I sent them on. Haku then asked the question of what would happen if someone taught the clone a new jutsu while it was separated from me? Or what would happen if I sent out 100 clones and each one found someone to teach them a different jutsu in that one day? Would I then know 100 new jutsu in one day when I dispelled those clones? I couldn't believe just how much of a genius Haku was. I had never in my wildest dreams thought of such a possibilities. Of course we did put it to the test, and it turned out to be true. It was really possible to learn through my clones, and this was a boon because I, the original, could afford to focus solely on my physical training while my clones did all the theory and the ninjutsu for me. Under normal circumstances, overusing this technique for this purpose would be dangerous. However, I am an Uzumaki, a Jinshiriki, and I have Haku. My body, including my brain are exceptionally durable as an Uzumaki. My mindscape as a Jinshiriki is flexible and expansive, it even holds the mind of a century, possibly millennia old entity, and last but not least, I had Haku in said mindscape, who helped to organize, store, and file the information properly in my mind. My potential with his training style was near unlimited. We could have learned all three of Fuutan, Sutan, and Hyotan in that four months, but Haku was against such an idea. He wanted complete mastery and diversity over each element. So we decided to focus on Sudan alone for that four months in terms of elemental manipulation. The first month was meant to teach me how to access my water element. It took me just a week, no, actually, just five days for me to master this technique with the shadow clone training. However, Haku refused to teach me any jutsu until the following the month. He didn't just want normal mastery over the element, he wanted me to manipulate water in the same manner as I blink, or in the same manner as I breathe, subconsciously without the need to focus without the need to meditate or concentrate heavily, and within a snap of the fingers. It was not only about the speed and ease of execution however, it was also about the scale. He wanted me to be able to move water at the size and speed of an injutsu without actually molding hand seals and without using a shape manipulation, basically, to bend the water to my will alone. I wondered to myself if something like this had ever been done before. Haku explained that the Hozuki clan of Kiri had such an ability and that even he had the ability as that is how his mother had discovered he had a bloodline limit. He said that I should be able to do it because I was merged with him and because I already had a strong water and wind affinity before the merger, and therefore my affinity was much stronger than normal. And so this continued for a month, and both Haku and I were more than a little impressed by the achievement to say the least. I managed to reach a level where I did in fact bend the water to my will on a large scale, but not only that, I also reached a level where I could create water out of thin air, in other words, manipulating the hydrogen and oxygen atoms in the atmosphere. The following month was spent learning every water ninjutsu that Haku knew, and let me tell you, the list was incredibly long. It would have taken a year and a half, maybe two, hell, possibly even more to learn all those jutsu if it wasn't for my clones and Haku's help, but I managed to do it in a single month. The third month on the other hand I was spent trying to create new suit and jutsu. Haku told me that the mark of a great shinobi is one who doesn't merely replicate what he is taught but one who either improves on what he was taught or uses what he is taught as inspiration for new inventions. He also explained that every great shinobi has a jutsu unique only to himself, a trump card so to speak. And that's how the third month went, my clones tasked with coming up with ideas for new water style ninjutsu. The fourth month was spent simulating combat situations where I actually used my sutin in combat situations. I also continued to task my clones with jutsu creation and refinement of my ninjutsu. That's not to say that water manipulation was the only thing my clones did in that four months. Many other squadrons of clones participated in many other tasks. There were anatomical, botanical, and medical lessons that Haku held for my other clones. There were also lectures where the history of the shinobi world, past and present leaders and war strategist, leaders, and legends of the like were studied in depth. There was also maths, chemistry and physics lectures and introduction to the sealing arts, which was my personal favorite, my guilty pleasure so to speak. Haku even taught me everything he was taught as a hunter Nin and Anbu operative, just like how Zabuzo had taught him. I even ended up learning the silent killing technique and Kenjutsu, which would be very useful for my job as an Anbu officer and a hunter Nin. One other thing Haku helped me master was my chakra sensing. 
I've always been a chakra sensor, but perhaps I was too stupid to realize it. No, rather, I assumed that everyone who unlocked their chakra inherited this ability automatically, since I became aware of it as soon as I unlocked my chakra for the first time. Or perhaps it was the fact that it wasn't that refined. I could sense chakra presences, but I couldn't distinguish them. In other words, I wouldn't be able to tell if Sasuke or Kakashi were sneaking up on me, just that someone with strong chakra was sneaking up on me. My clones refined this technique for me, my distance has significantly improved and I can tell even the most minute details about someone's chakra, including of course who it is that I'm sensing or whether they were about to use a jutsu or not and from which part of their body they were going to release said jutsu. All in all, I'm a far more advanced shinobi than I used to be now. And I'm ready to pass Tsunade Ba, I mean Sunday Summer's test. Gotta start acting like a real Anbu operative now, can't be calling her that anymore. So you're still serious about joining the Anbu? Tsunade asked with a deathly tone, her hands clasped together over her desk, trying to bore a hole through Naruto's soul with her eyes alone. She had to admit that Naruto had changed quite a lot over the past four months. No one had seen him at all in that whole time, it was almost like he disappeared off of the face of the earth. If it wasn't for the barrier squad and sensor division that was charged with village security, she would have been worried that Akatsuki had perhaps captured him from right under their noses. His outfit was quite significantly different right now, gone was the Hidesli neon orange jumpsuit, replaced with pitch black shinobi pants with blue tape around the Yangus and equally dark blue shinobi sandals, along with a black long sleeve top with three dark blue bands on his right arm, and one on his left hand wrist seemingly with the intention of holding the sleeves intact. A weapons pouch could be found on his right leg too. My mind will not be swayed, besides, I'm not one who can easily go back on his word, you should know that by now. Naruto replied with a straight face, causing Tsunade to sigh in dismay. How could I forget about that, of course the idiot wouldn't go back on his word. Tsunade thought with a mental roll of the eyes. Well I suppose it doesn't matter anyway, there's no way he is going to pass the test that I have set up for him. Tsunade thought feeling a little guilty about crushing his hopes, but then quickly pushing the feeling down to the back of her mind and the lowest depths of her heart, this was for his own good anyway. She was just looking out for him, he had no idea what he was getting himself into after all. What's with the change of outfit anyway? I'll admit that it looks more professional, but it also looks rather, dull, for you at least. Tsunade asked curiously. A Chinese vest will look better with this outfit as opposed to my orange jumpsuit. Besides, you said it yourself. It does look more professional. Naruto replied, Che. You sure are full of yourself aren't you, you think passing this test will be that simple? Tsunade asked rhetorically. As a matter of fact, yes I do think it will be rather simple for someone of my skill and talent. Naruto replied with a confident smirk. Oh ho 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 ho. You just never learned do you? Jiraiya said from the window seal, jumping into the office seemingly unannounced even though Tsunade and Shizun always knew he was there anyway. It's been a long time Jiraiya-sensei. Pity I won't be able to keep you company in your adventures. Naruto greeted tauntingly. Ah ha 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 ha. My beloved student, you're certainly one of a kind, Jiraiya laughed. He wouldn't be my number one hyperactive and unpredictable student if he wasn't, Kakashi said, now crouching on the same window seal that Jiraiya was recently crouched upon. You know you guys didn't have to follow me all the way to the Hokage's office. You could have just accompanied me, Naruto said, scratching the back of his head sheepishly. Hey 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 hey. I'm not sure I know what you're talking about Naruto, Kakashi said unconvincingly. Um, sure, I guess. Naruto replied with a sweat drop. He knew we were following him all this time? I don't know about Kakashi, but I was being as stealthy as I can possibly be back there. Has Naruto really improved that much? Jiraiya thought contemplatively, the same thoughts going through Kakashi's mind at that very moment. Ahem. You two should start developing the habit of using the door like civilized humans when you enter my office, otherwise I just might develop the habit of pulverizing certain male genitals," Tsunade said with a threatening undertone, causing both Kakashi and Jiraiya to sweat nervously. Anyway, when do I begin the test? I'm ready now. Naruto cut in, both Jiraiya and Kakashi mentally thanking Naruto for diverting Tsunade's attention away from their genitals. It depends, which part of the test do you want to start with? The written part, or the practical slash battle part? Tsunade asked. The battle off course. I'd like to get that part out of the way immediately. Naruto replied. Can't wait to show off huh? Tsunade asked with a knowing smirk. Off course, isn't that the whole point of a Chinese examination? In a manner of speaking that is. Naruto retorted. Che. You have a weird way of looking at things as always. Tsunade thought with a mental roll of the eyes. Okay then, meet us in training ground 7 in 30 minutes. Use the remaining time to gather your thoughts and plan your strategies. 
you're going to need it. Tsunade trailed off darkly. Hi, Hokage-sama, Naruto said with a respectful bow before proceeding to exit the office. What do you make of this Naruto-kun? Haku asked curiously. They're going to make me do the bell test. My opponent is definitely Kakashi-sensei. Naruto replied. The bell test huh? Seems like quite a ruse to me, they really have no intention of letting you join the Anbu do they? Haku asked rhetorically. No they don't, but at the same time, they are clearly underestimating me. I'm not the same kid I was before, and besides the fact that I already know the Sharingan's weakness, I also happen to have you on my side, a trump card that no enemy will ever know about, my best friend who will always be there for me, Naruto declared passionately. I like the confidence and passion with which you speak Naruto-kun, it's honestly quite amazing how you never doubt yourself. Haku replied, I'm the Kyubi Jinchiriki and I've put my body through hell over the last four months. I've applied my mind soul and body over that same time period and I've got a genius like you on my side. There's no reason to be afraid of anything, Haku. All I have to do is do my best, that's all there is to it." Naruto retorted, Haku once again reaffirming to himself his decision to stay with Naruto, not having even a single regret regarding his current state right now, content to see the world for the rest of his existence from Naruto's eyes. Besides, technically speaking, he was already dead anyway. He had no right to complain as far as he was concerned. Thirty minutes later, they're coming, Naruto said in his thoughts, not that he really needed to as Haku was already aware of that, he did have access to all of Naruto's senses after all. Let's do this. Haku replied with an air of confidence and determination, Shizune, Jiraiya, Kakashi, and Tsunade arriving in that moment with a leaf sunshine technique. It's time, Tsunade said with a serious tone. I take it I'm fighting against Kakashi-sensei? What will it be? The bell test again. Naruto asked rhetorically. What makes you think that you're fighting me? Kakashi asked nonchalantly. It might have something to do with the many traps that you set up around the parameter of the training ground. A lot of shadow clones had to die to release those traps you know. You're one sadistic bastard Kakashi-sensei. Naruto replied casually, almost as if without a care in the world. As expected of my student, he knows me well enough to identify my work with a single glance. Kakashi thought, I take it you managed to set your own traps in the process? Kakashi asked curiously, nope, didn't get a chance to. I wanted to make absolutely sure that all of your traps were discovered and released. That took too much of my time and I didn't get to set my own traps as a result. I have no regrets though, there is no substitute for vigilance. Naruto replied, so he figured out the purpose of giving him a 30 minute head start was in order to give him a chance to make preemptive battle preparations. Not only that. But he must have also realized that whoever was testing him would have known about this part of the exam for quite a while now, and because of that, he took care to scout the area for any surprises that might lay in store for him. Last but not least, the nature and style of the traps set out in the battlefield, and the fact that the exam is taking place in Training Ground 7, and combine that with the fact that Kakashi-san was in Tsunade-sama's office earlier, he was able to use those subtle hints to accurately discern to the most minute detail what kind of test was in store for him. Sugoi, Naruto-kun is truly amazing, I can't believe how much he's grown in such a short space of time. Shizun thought with a proud smile, similar analysis going through Tsunade, Kakashi, and Jiraiya's mind as well. You've done well Naruto, but that was just the easy part. You have to actually get the bells for me this time. There's no hidden meaning behind the test and there is no alternate way to pass except to get the bells. Also, I won't be holding back this time around. You are the hero that defeated the formerly undefeated Sabaku no Gara and Shukaku after all, and I saw the damage that your battle with Sasuke did at the Valley of the End. I'll give you the respect that your achievements deserve, even though you aren't allowed to use the fox in this exam like you did in those two battles," Kakashi said with a deathly tone, lifting up the left side of his headband to reveal a three Tami Sharingan. Haku. Naruto signaled. Don't worry Naruto-kun, as we agreed, I will cancel any genjutsu cast upon you. Just focus on the Nin and Taijutsu and leave the Genjutsu to me, Haku said reassuringly, Naruto replying with a simple thank you, and as promised, dedicating his mind, body, and soul to Tai and Ninjutsu and content to leave the rest in Haku's trusted hands. State your rules of engagement, Naruto said with serious face, a strong breeze washing over the area as the duo focused their chakra and intent, so much so that the atmosphere was practically suffocating. Use of the Kyuubi's chakra is not permitted, everything else is legal. Your goal is to get the two interconnected bells from my waist, and you have 24 hours to do that. You will automatically fail the Chunin examination if you fail to get the bells. One last thing, if you don't attack with the intent to kill, you will not only fail to get the bells from me, you might actually die. 
Kakashi trailed off with a dangerous tone, Do you still want to continue Naruto, even under those conditions? Tsunade asked with a taunting smirk, That goes without saying. I'm taking those bells in less than an hour, 24 hours is overkill. Naruto replied, pointing at the bells with a confident but dead serious expression, Kakashi's eye narrowing in anger at what he perceived to be Naruto's ignorance and arrogance, feeling totally underestimated right now. You must have prepared quite well to be that confident. Unless you actually think that you're stronger than Kakashi, that would be plain stupid off course, Jirai laughed. Who knows? We won't know until we fight now will we, Jiraiya sensei? Naruto replied, oh oh ho 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 ho. You really are an idiot aren't you? Jiraiya laughed amusedly. HN. Was all Naruto said. Kakashi's eyes just became so much darker. Naruto must have really hit a nerve. I must do something otherwise he might just crush Naruto's will for good. Jiraiya thought with concern. Well. Too bad Kakashi is not going to be your opponent today. Better luck next time. Ha 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 ha. Ah ha 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 ha, Jirai laughed like a total idiot, Shizun, Kakashi, and Tsunade giving him the most incredulous look Naruto had ever seen in his life. What's the meaning of this, Sensei? Naruto asked irritably. You must always expect the unexpected in the shinobi world. As my apprentice, it is entirely possible, and in fact very likely that you will one day take over my spy network. You have to learn to always make provision for the possibility that the information you've collected might either be incorrect or it might possibly be outdated. Any situation can change and what you expected might not necessarily be what you encounter. You can spend countless hours and days making preparations for a situation and everything might change in a heartbeat and you have to improvise and adapt accordingly. This is not only true for a spy master, but for a Chinese as well, one who will be required to lead squadrons at times. Jiraiya explained, J. Jiraiya-sama. You're not planning to fight Naruto-kun yourself are you? Shizun asked fearfully. Not quite, Kushio Snojutsu, Jiraiya exclaimed after drawing blood from his thumb, planting his right hand on the surface of the earth as he summoned a gigantic purple toad with a black coat, a huge shield held in its left hand, and a two-pin staff on its right hand, Jiraiya, Tsunade, Shizun, and Kakashi suddenly finding themselves 50 meters higher than they were before with a great view of the whole village. I've never met this toad before, who are you? Naruto demanded authoritatively. You're the other Toad Summoner, the one who fought Shukaku with the boss aren't you? The Toad asked curiously. Yes, that is me. Uzumaki Naruto. Naruto introduced himself. I am Gamaken. Even though I'm clumsy compared to the boss, I would also like to fight by your side one day, Gamaken said humbly. Me too. But it seems like we'll be fighting against each other today. Naruto replied. These are my rules Naruto. You may not use the fox's power. And you have to either defeat Gamaken or survive him for 24 hours in order to pass the exam. Those are the only rules. Do you accept the conditions? Jirai shouted from above the giant toad. I accept. Naruto replied, Okay, Kakashi, Shizun, Haim, let's go. Jirai ordered, using the Shunshine technique again to get away from the impending battle, but not before telling Gamaken not to hold back against the blonde Uzumaki. What the hell do you think you're doing, Jiraiya? Tsunade demanded pulling Jiraiya close to her with her left hand by the scruff of the neck, her right one cocked back and ready to deliver a knockout blow if the response was not to her satisfaction. The point is to get him to back down from joining the Anbu, not to crush his will completely. Jiraiya replied with a surprisingly serious tone. I'm not sure I follow Jiraiya-sama, wouldn't fighting against Kakashi-san have accomplished the same thing? Shizun asked with a confused expression. No, Jiraiya-sama is correct. I temporarily lost it there for a second. It's my fault for getting riled up by Naruto's words, it was a rookie mistake on my part, Kakashi said apologetically. What the hell are you two baffoons talking about? Tsunade asked irritably. What I mean is that Kakashi lost control of his emotions and was about to crush Naruto. It's not his fault, Naruto has a way of getting to even the most composed and calmest of hearts, it's the reason he was able to persuade you to come back to the village, and also the reason he has been able to get so many people to acknowledge him even dark people like the Hyuga and Shukaku brat. However, this personality trait can also be a double-edged sword, we would have seen the negative side effects of it if I hadn't intervened. Jiraiya explained, causing both Shizune and Tsunade's eyes to widen in surprise at that revelation. I, I see, that certainly makes sense now that you've explained it. Tsunade trailed off thoughtfully, finally releasing Jiraiya from her dangerous grasp, Jiraiya breathing a huge sigh of relief knowing that his very existence had been temporarily compromised for a second there. Ahem. I'm glad you intervened Jiraiya, however, the situation doesn't seem to have changed much. 
it seems like we only switched from an overwhelming difference in skill and experience to an overwhelming difference in power and experience. Tsunade observed, The circumstances have changed but our mission is still the same. Naruto must not join the Anbu and he must go on the training trip with Jiraiya-sama. Gamakin-san is a more than worthy substitute. Kakashi replied, Well, anyway it looks like they've about to start. Let's see what happens, Tsunade said, everyone now paying attention to the battlefield. I don't know all the details, but I've been ordered to defeat you or hold you off for 24 hours. Buntasama has spoken highly of you, so don't expect me to hold back. Gamakin warned, That's my line for you. Water style. Great nine-tailed demon fox technique, Naruto exclaimed with his hands clasped together, creating an incredible amount of water from thin air, using shape manipulation to shape it into a nine-tailed fox that was even bigger than Gamakin, Naruto's body floating in the middle of the head as he faced off against the gigantic toad. To say everyone, and that means everyone, was shocked would be an incredible understatement, Shizune, Tsunade, Jiraiya, and Gamakin unable to believe not only the fact that Naruto was able to create water out of thin air. Not only the sheer size and scale of the water, but even the nature of the jutsu itself, seemingly creating a summon level creature with elemental and shape manipulation alone, without even molding any hand seals. This is my great nine-tailed demon fox technique, this technique was inspired by both the entity that lives within me and Kiri's water prison technique. As you might or might not know, the surface of the water prison technique is many times harder than steel and the water inside is also many times denser than normal water. In other words, if you exchange blows with me now, you will most certainly break a number of bones in your body, worst case scenarios, you outright die or become crippled for life. Naruto explained patiently, so I'll ask you this only once, are you sure you want to fight me? You have the option to forfeit you know. Naruto asked, I don't want to fight you, but I have my orders, and I don't back down from a challenge. I'll fight you, Gamakin declared passionately, clumsy as I am. The warrior toad muttered not so warrior-like, he's completely submerged in the water. Therefore, this can't be a technique that he can use for an extended period time. But he's also probably aware of this himself, so he must have trained his lungs to hold his breath for a long time. No, I shouldn't be too worried about that. No matter how much he trains his lungs, he's still only human. Gamakin thought as he leapt up into the air with every intention of getting the first blow in only to be swiftly and harshly pulled back down to earth, both physically and mentally, two tails of Naruto's nine-tailed water fox bursting out of the ground and grabbing tightly on Gamakin's ankles. He can change the shape of the tails into arms? Gamakin thought in shock, but swiftly broken out of his split-second trance as he was shoulder-charged with devastating force by the demon water fox. The result was quite devastating and incredibly smart and strategic from Naruto as Gamakin's body was flung away at a rapid force and speed, but because of Naruto's water limbs holding tightly at Gamakin ankles, a recoil effect from being flung in two directions caused Gamakin's arms both reflexively and by force to get flung backwards, leaving his guard open for Naruto to exploit as Gamakin's whole body became open for attack. To ensure that Gamakin's guard remained open, Naruto shaped three more tails into arms and used them to further pin the giant toe down, all three water arms bursting from under the ground and enclosing on each of their targets one around each wrist and one around the mouth area. Now you can't form hand seals and you can't spit out any jutsu from your mouth cavity either, on top of the fact that your powerful toad legs can't elevate you anymore, Naruto said with a cold expression in his eyes. This is the part where I would usually ask you to surrender, but I won't be taking any chances, Naruto said as he delivered a devastating downward punch on Gamakin's torso, the impact of the punch dwarfing anything that even Tsunade was capable of producing with her super strength technique the whole landscape becoming deformed and reshaped. A forest's worth of trees tumbling under the earthquake-like effects of the force exerted on the earth. A puff of smoke could be seen surrounding the area where Naruto's water arm had impacted on the earth, this time having used the water fox's upper frontal limbs to launch his attack. Did he dispel himself just before impact? Or did Jiraiya-sensei cancel the summoning himself? Naruto pondered to himself. That doesn't matter right now, what matters is that you won the battle, this qualifies as a retreat doesn't it? Haku responded, Yes, yes indeed. Dadabayo. Naruto replied, causing Haku to chuckle at Naruto's verbal tick kicking in after quite some time now. Haku had tried very hard to get rid of it by administering heavy penalties and punishments every time Naruto had a relapse, however, he'd eventually found out that it was impossible to completely get rid of it, it would always come back when Naruto was overly excited. The important thing was that he didn't use it anywhere near as often as he used to before, in fact, 
he never used it anymore as long as he was calm and composed, or focused on a specific task. Unable to detect any further threats with his keen senses, the blonde Uzumaki cancelled his water style, great nine-tailed demon fox technique, the fox completely evaporating in a matter of seconds thanks to the blonde Uzumaki's ability to manipulate hydrogen and oxygen atoms. It was a solution he had come by because of the implications and consequences of simply cancelling the chakra feed to his jutsu as that would mean that he would run the risk of drowning his comrades or even worse, innocent civilians that might have been in the vicinity at the time. If he couldn't evaporate it, the jutsu could have potentially been useless in terms of protecting comrades or protecting the village, and Naruto felt that he had no use for a jutsu like that, as shinobi worked in teams most of the time anyway. Uoi! I defeated and conquered your challenge. Come out and face the music, Naruto shouted in the direction that he knew his superiors were. I... I can't believe Naruto-kun defeated Gamakin-san on his own, that's, it's just unbelievable, Shizune exclaimed in shock and disbelief. That's the least of it Shizune, just what the hell is that jutsu that Naruto used just now? How can a Janon be capable of producing a jutsu of that scale? He didn't even use the Kyuubi's chakra did he? Tsunade trailed off in shock. No, I was unable to detect any of the fox's chakra with my Sharingan, that was all Naruto. But to think that he could produce a jutsu like this from just seeing Zabuza's water prison that one time. Kakashi thought, trying to keep his cool but despite that anyone with even a single brain cell would be able to tell just how astonished he was. This is bad, I didn't expect Naruto to defeat Gamakin, and I certainly didn't expect him to be hiding such a monstrous trump card. When did he learn elemental manipulation anyway? Jiraiya asked, his eyes cast on Kakashi accusingly. Don't look at me, I had no idea myself. More importantly, how did he even learn elemental manipulation so quickly? No, actually, how is it even possible for him or anyone for that matter to have a water jutsu that powerful? I've never heard of anything like that before, not even from Hoshigaki Kisame and Nidaim Sama. Kakashi pointed out. None of that is important right now. What's important is what you have to do now Kakashi, Tsunade said authoritatively. Um, I'm not sure I understand Hokage-sama? Kakashi asked with a slightly confused expression. We have to stop Naruto from getting that Chunin promotion at all costs, at least until after he goes on the training trip with Jiraiya. I'm sure this Anbu and Hunter Nin nonsense will be out of his head by then. So we'll have to go back to plan A, you'll have to do the bell test and make sure that he doesn't win, Tsunade said with a determined expression. De Tsunade sama. I urge you to reconsider, I know that we didn't set any specific parameters regarding this part of the exam, or any part of it actually. But Naruto-kun is not stupid, he'll realize what's happening and he won't like it. No Janon would ever have to defeat Gamakin in order to get a promotion in the first place, and it goes without saying that they wouldn't be expected to fight an elite Jonin right after fighting a boss-level Dode summon. If you do this, I fear that our relationship with Naruto-kun might become permanently damaged. Please reconsider your decision Tsunade-sama. Shizune pleaded desperately. I'm afraid I have to agree with Shizune on this one. This decision could backfire horribly. Naruto is already estranged with the villagers and most of the shinobi force because of what he is, if he becomes estranged with the higher-ups as well, then we might as well have created another Sasuke or even worse, Orochimaru. We have to be careful how we handle things from here on out, Kakashi said with a voice of reason. Then what do you expect me to do? Let Naruto join the Anbu? Kakashi, you know what it's like in there, do you really want to see Naruto go through that on top of everything that he's been through already? Tsunade asked desperately. Don't lose hope so soon Tsunade Haim. There's still a written test coming up isn't there? If there's anything I know about my apprentice, it is that written exams are his greatest weakness. I'm told that he is the only Janan in the history of the Chinese exams who passed the written exam without answering a single question, Jiraiya said with a small chuckle. Where did you get that nonsense Jiraiya? Tsunade asked incredulously. It's true. I heard it once from Manko. According to her. Ibiki says that Naruto didn't even attempt a single question in the written exam. They are under the impression that Naruto had already figured out the true purpose of the exam from the beginning. But I, as his sensei, know better than anyone that there is no way Naruto knew any of the answers, and he almost definitely did not figure out the hidden meaning behind it. He probably had no idea what to do. Kakashi explained. So you're saying that Naruto-kun will definitely fail the written exam that we have prepared for him? Shizune asked curiously. Most certainly. Kakashi replied confidently, Okay. Let's do this, Tsunade declared, slamming her palm against her fist excitedly as she walked out of the shadows and into the clearing to meet up with the blonde-haired Uzumaki. So you finally decided to show up and bask in my awesomeness? Naruto taunted, Don't get ahead of yourself brat, you're not a Chunin yet, we still have the written part of the exam, plus, 
you still have to prove to us that you won't endanger your squad mates by losing control of the fox. Tsunade chastised. Part of the reason for joining the Anbu is to gain the emotional control required in order to control and suppress the fox's sinister intent, so I don't understand why you would deny me entry because of a current lack of control. There's also the fact that I'm going to be a hunter nin, I was under the impression that hunter nin mostly work alone, Naruto said with an inquiring undertone. Only the elite of the elite ever hunt alone. You're still a rookie, you won't work alone until you get an A-class ranking, that is if you even make it through the upcoming tests. Kakashi retorted. If that's all, then I will be hunting alone in no time at all T-by-O, Naruto said excitedly, although he wasn't even half or even a quarter as loud and boisterous as he was just over four months ago. Anyway, before we carry on, we have a few questions for you Naruto. Tsunade trailed it with a serious tone, giving Naruto a meaningful stare. You want to ask about my water manipulation and the jutsu I used on Gamma san Naruto asked rhetorically. Well now that we got that out of the way, where did you learn water manipulation? And who taught you about elemental manipulation? Tsunade demanded. I've known about elemental manipulation for a while now. It would actually be quite silly of me not to know about it given how often Sasuke and Kakashi sensei used it. As for learning how to actually use it, I'm self taught. Naruto replied simply. Self taught? You're telling me you taught yourself such a high level technique like the one you used on Gamakan? Jirai asked incredulously. Do you know anyone else who uses the great nine tailed demon fox technique? Naruto asked with equal incredulity, how did you teach yourself elemental manipulation exactly? I mean, it's not that I'm doubting you Naruto-kun, but I've never heard of such a thing in my life before. Shizune asked, the only one Naruto noted who was more curious than suspicious of him. I taught myself that the shadow clone technique didn't I? Why is it hard to believe that I can teach myself water manipulation when I have such a strong affinity for it? Naruto asked rhetorically, that's different though. You had a scroll from which to learn Cage Bunshine from, where did you get a water manipulation scroll, or who is it that taught you? Jiraiya asked again. I can guarantee you that no one alive under the sun and the moon taught me elemental manipulation. I am self-taught through trial and error. I practically lived in the water for the past four months. Naruto explained in exasperation. Okay fine whatever, just tell me how many water techniques do you know exactly? Tsunade demanded authoritatively. Too many to count. It would be best to assume that I know at least 75% of every water jutsu out there. Naruto replied, and all of that is self-taught? Jirai asked suspiciously. In case you haven't realized, I've had a lot of encounters with water release users. There's Momochi Zabuza, Yuki Haku, Aoi Ivame, an Amazian on team in the Chaninin exams, and there's even Kakashi Sensei in the boss dode game Abunta. Gamakachi is also good at water manipulation. I've also created my own variations like the jutsu you just saw just now. Naruto explained, that's quite a lot of jutsu to learn in just four months, learning and mastering a single element alone can even take up to three years, and you not only did it in four months, but you managed to create what is probably the most powerful water element any of us have ever seen. That is logically impossible, even a genius like Sasuke wouldn't be able to do something like that. Kakashi argued, you've always thought of him as superior to me haven't you? Naruto asked rhetorically, and Naruto, that's not what I meant. No, it's fine. But remember that we are talking about the same Sasuke who learned lightning style and Chidori in just one month, and we are talking about the same Naruto who learned Shadow Clone in a two hours and Rasengan in three weeks. Contrary to popular belief, I'm a genius in my own right too, Kakashi Sensei. Naruto replied in a dead serious tone. And Naruto. Anyway, Naruto. I need you to promise you won't use that technique recklessly, Tsunade said. What technique hack? Naruto cried out. Tsunade punching him hard on the head in anger and irritation. What the hell do you think I'm talking about? You'll damage your respiratory system or even kill yourself if you use the technique on regular basis. You can only hold your breath for so long while expanding that much chakra before your respiratory system collapses. Not to mention the brain damage you might get from the severe lack of oxygen Tsunade argued. Not true at all. What did you say? Tsunade asked with a threatening undertone. Don't get me wrong, I'm not undermining your medical expertise but I know my own jutsu better than anyone else. You see, I happen to have the ability to manipulate hydrogen and oxygen atoms, hence the ability to create water out of thin air, along with the ability to evaporate my jutsu instead of flooding the whole battlefield after use. I don't need to breathe in the conventional sense of the word, I can oxygenate my lungs, my bloodstream, my tissues, my cells, and my organs with my ninjutsu prowess as a result of this power over oxygen and hydrogen that I have. Of course it means that I expand more chakra as a result, 
but the rich oxygen and even hydrogen levels means that I regenerate chakra that much faster, as my body functions at an optimal level when I use this jutsu, plus I have a lot of chakra to burn anyway. Naruto replied with a proud smile, and my chakra control is 20 times better compared to the atrocious control I had before. Naruto thought, this is amazing. When did Naruto-kun become so smart? Shizun thought with a heart full of pride and admiration, a small blush adorning each one of her cheeks. When did my apprentice grow up so fast? Does he have someone else mentoring him? Kakashi doesn't seem to know anything about his sudden growth either, so does that mean that he is a secret teacher? That wouldn't be a problem under normal circumstances, except that this isn't a normal circumstance. Naruto is Konoha's ultimate weapon. No one is allowed to interact with him so intimately unless he or she is trusted by the Hokage and their intentions are ascertainable. I'll have to investigate this thoroughly. No, I won't be able to keep an eye on him while I'm away, I should get Kakashi to help me out on this one. Jiraiya thought wearily. Hmm, I suppose that makes sense, somewhat. But I'm warning you, if I find out that you're hiding anything from me, Tsunade said threateningly. You'll pulverize me, yeah, I get that. Now let's get on with the next part of the exam shall we? What is it, control over the fox? How do we do this? Naruto demanded impatiently. We need you to um. Tsunade trailed off contemplatively. He could use a one-tailed chakra cloak four months ago according to the report he gave regarding his battle with the Uchiha brat. Given the results of his four-month training vacation, I'm willing to bet that he spent all of his time working on water manipulation alone. He shouldn't have had a chance to work on his Jinchuriki powers. If both Tenzo and Jiraiya were here, I'd make him use five tails just to make sure he fails, but with only Jiraiya available right now, I don't want to put everything on his ceiling tags alone. That would be dangerous without Tenzo's Makutan to back us up should something go wrong. Tsunade thought contemplatively. I want you to demonstrate the ability to produce three tails without losing control. If you can do that, then I'll let you do the written exam. Tsunade ordered. I can trust Jiraiya's tags to handle three tails with no problem. If he fails to suppress three tails with his tags then I'll kill him with my bare hands. Tsunade rationalized sadistically. Three tails huh? He he he. Child's play. Naruto said confidently. Wait Naruto, Jiraiya said hastily. What? Naruto asked impatiently. There's a lot of people watching us now, many of them must have seen your water fox and Gamakin fighting. Then there's also the earthquake that you caused. It would be better we do this somewhere else don't you think, Tsunadeheim? Jiraiya asked rhetorically. Hmm, alright fine, we'll cancel the fox test. It's not that important given the fact that the whole point of the trip is for you to teach him how to control it anyway and there's someone who can help him with that in the Anbu too as you know. So let's just skip to the written test immediately, we'll all watch him carefully to make sure he doesn't cheat. Follow me, Tsunade ordered as she shunshined back towards her office, Kakashi, Shizun, Jiraiya, and Naruto following right behind her, both Haku and Naruto wondering just who was this person in the Anbu that could help them to master the fox's chakra. Oh 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 I don't believe this. Tsunade trailed off in astonishment, Jiraiya. Kakashi, and Shizun hovering over her shoulder as they all looked at Naruto's mark script, a script showing a mark of 200 out of 200, in other words, a 100% mark, an uncomfortable silence taking hold of the Hokage's office post Naruto's departure. He must have cheated somehow, there's no other explanation, Jiraiya concluded. That's not possible, we were all watching him carefully throughout the whole thing, and more importantly, I had my Sharingan trained on him the whole time. I'm quite certain I didn't miss anything. Besides, even if he had really cheated, he'd have only proved himself worthy of a Chunin promotion just by that feat alone, he'd have acted like a real shinobi should when confronted with a difficult situation. Kakashi retorted, Kuso. I can't believe this is happening, it wasn't supposed to turn out like this. Tsunade thought out loud, frustration clearly written all over her facial features. Maybe Jiraiya-sama can still convince him to change his mind? Shizun suggested. No, that won't work. Naruto will never abandon his Nindo. Once he makes a promise, even if to himself, he definitely and without compromise goes out of his way to fulfill it. He'd probably choose death over going back on his word. Kakashi replied, I see. Well, I know this might be something out of place to say, but am I the only one that thinks that Chunin Vest looks great on Naruto-kun? Shizun asked rhetorically, apologizing and asking that they forget she said anything when she felt the killing intent coming from all three of the elite shinobi she was surrounded by, a nervous expression etched onto her facial features. Meanwhile, right outside the Hokage building, and Naruto, Sakura exclaimed with a slight stutter, a pissed-off expression etched onto her facial expression, but not only hers, 
Tenten and Ino also not pleased at all if the expressions on their faces were anything to go by. The last thing Naruto expected when he left the Hokage building was to see the whole Rookie 11 gathered together like this, or rather, Rookie 10 since Sasuke was no longer part of the village. Of course he'd sensed their chakra before he left the building, but he figured it wouldn't be so much of a bad idea to see them one more time before he disappeared, and besides he was quite curious as to why they were all bundled up together like this. He could honestly say that he hadn't seen all of them together in one place since the Chunin exam preliminaries, and it hadn't been by choice by back then, it was purely coincidence as the waiting area was only so big. Yo! What are you guys all doing here? It's not going to be my birthday anytime soon so I doubt you're planning a surprise birthday party for me, unless of course, you're planning a Chunin promotion party for me? Hmm, no, you couldn't have known about that could you? I guess it's something else. Naruto trailed off with a thoughtful expression. Hmm, I can't really think of anything else, so why don't you guys tell me what's up? Naruto asked with an eye smile. I, I'm glad you're okay and Naruto-kun. W we were less so worried about you. Hinata said with a heavy blush, shyly pressing her fingers together, her eyes cast downwards nervously. You stole my line Hinata-chan. You know I've really been worried about you, in fact, I was planning to come and check on you before my departure. You look very good and healthy though, have you fully recovered from your injuries? Naruto asked curiously, causing Hinata's eyes to widen in shock at Naruto's words, her heart leaping and dancing happily. The Hyuga princess overjoyed at the possibility that she was all that had been in Naruto's thoughts since he disappeared. It's been four months since you disappeared dumbass. Of course her injuries have healed over that time. Hinata-chan is not that weak, certainly not as weak as you, Kiba said angrily, pointing an accusing finger at the blonde Uzumaki. I know she's not weak, Hinata-chan is the bravest Kunoichi I know after all, Naruto said with a genuine smile, his arms folded behind his head with a completely relaxed and satisfied demeanor. Hinata staring at the blonde Uzumaki with a shocked but joyful expression, almost on the verge of tears as she couldn't believe that she was receiving such praise and recognition from her long-term crush. Sakura on the other hand didn't look so good at the moment, she'd also been training very hard in the last four months and she'd finally managed to revive a dead fish with her new medical skills, an achievement that meant that she had finally mastered, or at least learned how to use the mystic palm technique. She'd thought that she was getting closer to Naruto and Sasuke and she'd started to feel good about herself. Truthfully speaking, she couldn't wait to show off to Naruto, looking forward to the words of praise that he would have for her. But for him to so easily and most of all, sincerely say that Hinata was the bravest Kunoichi that he knew left her in total limbo in that moment because that was the sort of praise she wanted and felt that she deserved from Naruto. She honestly didn't know how that truly made her feel, although she did absolutely know for a fact that she didn't like that it made her feel that way, and she definitely didn't like to hear him speaking so fondly about another woman. In fact, she had been about to pulverize him right then there. If someone asked her why, she'd just say that she could see through Naruto's tactics, that he was influenced by his perverted sensei and that she wouldn't allow him to lure innocent Hinata-chan into his trap, after all, when had Naruto ever given any woman other than her so much attention before he met Jiraiya? Perhaps it was good fortune that Shikamaru chose that moment to cast his Lizina's aside and decide it wasn't too troublesome for him to talk or Team 7 would have been found guilty of infighting again and prove that they were the most dysfunctional team in the leaf. Naruto, is there something wrong with my eyes or is that a Chinese vest that you're wearing? And is there something also wrong with my ears or did you say something about your Chinese promotion? Shikamaru asked suspiciously. Oh yeah you guys don't know do you? Naruto said in mock surprise, a mischievous smirk plastered on his facial features, one that put everyone on edge as it was eerily similar to the expression he usually had when he was about to pull off one of his juvenile but also surprisingly intricate pranks. No we don't. That's why we all decided to come to the Hokage office to demand some answers. Although Ino and Sakura practically dragged us all the way here. Shikamaru drawled out. There's also the matter of the giant water fox and the toad that we saw fighting very close to the village proper. Neji and Shikamaru insisted that both the fox and the toad had something to do with Yushino said in his forever emotionless voice. Neji and Shikamaru huh? Out of all of my friends in Konoha, they are without a doubt the ones that are most likely to have figured out the secret behind my existence. It would be one thing if they concluded that the toad had something to do with me, but both the fox and the toad? Naruto thought wearily. I have to agree with you on this one Naruto-kun. They definitely know. Haku replied, well... Are you going to tell us what's going on or do I have to mind rape it out of you? Ino asked with a sinister undertone. Or would you prefer a more unconventional method? Sakura asked, smashing her right fist against her left hand menacingly. Hold your panties ladies. First I'll answer Shikamaru's question. No, actually, 
I'll just tell you everything that's happening, Naruto said, taking a deep and long breath before carrying on with his explanation. First thing you have to understand is that I'm a very famous and popular figure in the convent. Naruto started off, causing everyone to face fault at Naruto's seemingly ridiculous claim. Naruto, Sakura said with a malicious tone, I know it sounds totally ridiculous, but it's actually true. I'm famous and popular in Moon Country, the Hidden Star Village, the former Snow Country, now known as Spring Country, and Wave Island. They even named the longest and biggest bridge in the world, the bridge that connects Wave Island to the mainland, after me. It's called the Great Naruto Bridge now, you can check it out if you don't believe me, Naruto said, gaining everyone attention now that they realize just how serious he was. Because of this, my name has spread out to other countries as well, even countries outside the elemental nations. As a result, I have received an S-Class mission request, requesting specifically my services and mine alone. It has come from Demon Country and it is a long-term mission that will last for three years minimum. Naruto lied through his teeth. It wasn't a complete lie however, he did get a mission request from the Demon Priestess Maruko, but he lied about both the timing and the duration of the mission. The mission request stipulated only that Naruto would have to aid Maruko's daughter in her fight against a great evil that threatens the whole world and that he would only have to leave for Demon Country on a specific date three and a half years from now, in other words, Naruto wasn't going to Demon Country for at least three years contrary to what he told his comrades. However, this was the cover story he and Tsunade had agreed upon and therefore that is what he had to tell anyone who asked, that is if he decided to answer the question in the first place. Wait a minute what? You're telling me you're gonna be gone for more than three years on a single mission? What kind of mission takes three years? Tenten asked in disbelief, a sentiment shared by every one of the rookie ten. I can't disclose the mission specifics. But all you have to know is that Hokage-sama refused the Byakugan slash B Byakugan. Neji and Hinata exclaimed at the same time, both simultaneously activating their prize dujutsu, unashamedly scanning every inch of the blue-eyed Uzumaki. What's wrong, Hinata-chan, Neji? Naruto asked hastily. My apologies Naruto, but I had to make sure. Neji replied as he deactivated his Byakugan, Hinata also deactivating hers a few seconds later, a heavy and deeper than usual blush spotting on each of her cheeks, causing both Naruto and Haku to wonder just what the hell she was actually looking at. Had to make sure of what? Naruto asked with a confused expression. I noticed it the first time, but when you did it again I realized that it would be negligent on my part to let it slide again. Neji explained, I'm not sure I follow? Naruto said with an inquiring undertone. Your speech pattern has changed drastically. The pitch of your voice is significantly lower and your pronunciation of words is much more formal and accurate. But more importantly is the absence of your data bio catchphrase and your use of the proper title and honorific when referring to the Hokage. Hinata-sama noticed the same thing as I did and that's why we had to make sure. Neji explained with his typical calm and composed aura surrounding him. And you've never paid that much special attention to Hinata-sama before more especially when she's in a crowd. Your praise and attention must have made her suspicious of you. Neji thought internally. Also oh, that's what it is? Hea hey. Ninjutsu isn't the only thing I've been working on over the past four months. I've come to realize that I need to start thinking and acting like a Hokage already if I'm ever going to reach my dream, or if I'm ever going to surpass my predecessors. Naruto explained himself. That certainly makes a lot of sense when you put it that way. But could you please get back to what you were saying before the interruption? Tenten said impatiently. Okay where was I again? Oh, yes, a long term S rank mission. You see the thing is, Hokage Sama refused to acknowledge the mission request, she thought that it might be a trick from an enemy that is after me, more specifically, a scheme by Akatsuki to capture me. Akatsuki? What the hell is that? Sounds like some crazy cult. Ino cut in. It's an organization of S ranked criminals, in other words, an organization comprised of cage level ninja criminals the most dangerous organization in the world. Naruto explained, Oh please I'm not listening to this nonsense anymore. Come Sakura, maybe we'll get better answers from Tsunade-sama, Ino said as she attempted to walk past the blood Uzumaki and into the Hokage building, only for Naruto to grab her by the wrist with a near bone crushing grip. You're not going anywhere until I'm done explaining everything. You need to hear this for both yours and my own good. I'm tired of hiding and more importantly, Keeping this a secret is no longer beneficial to anyone. It would be selfish of me if I continued to keep it a secret because it will put all your lives in grave danger for as long as the possibility of us going on missions together in the future exists, Naruto said with a deathly tone. Stop trying to make yourself seem important you histrionic nutjob. Shut up and listen. Ino, Shikamaru exclaimed angrily, causing Ino's eyes to widen in shock, never ever having heard Shikamaru speak like that to her, 
or anyone for that matter, Naruto has something important to tell you. Show some respect, if not for him then at least for yourself, Shikamaru emphasized sternly, causing Ino to shrink away pathetically, not having any experience in dealing with such a scary version of Shikamaru. Thank you Shikamaru, now all of you listen carefully. Don't interrupt me until I'm done explaining. Naruto ordered, finally letting go of Ino's left hand wrist, everyone now listening attentively, even Sakura, who almost never listened to anything Naruto had to say unless it involved Sasuke. Uchiha Itachi and Hoshigaki Kisame, the monster of the mist, also known as the tailless by Juu because of his monstrous chakra reserves, were both sighted inside Konoha about a week after Orochimaru's invasion. They are both members of the Akatsuki and they came here looking for me. Fortunately I was away from the village with Jiraiya Sensei at the time but that didn't stop them from following me to Danzuki town. They found me alone in a hotel room but thankfully Jiraiya Sensei and later Guy Sensei arrived to save me. Sasuke and Kakashi Sensei were both put in a coma by Itachi's Genjutsu when they clashed with him but both recovered thanks to Jiraiya Sensei and are bringing Godaim Sama back to the village. Naruto explained taking a momentary pause before carrying on where he left off. It is also believed that Orochimaru is a former member of this organization just so you understand just how powerful these guys are and how lucky I am to have avoided capture so far. Now the answer to the obvious question as I am sure you all want to know why they are after me. The answer is simple and not so simple at the same time, it might come as a big shock to some of you but it is about time you found out about me. I'll just put it out there right away, the fourth Hokage didn't kill the QB. It is in fact impossible to kill a Baijuo. I am the QB, just as Gara is the Aichibi. These beasts were sealed into us at birth and over time our chakras have been merging together and the connection between us and the beasts inside are getting stronger, actually, Gara's connection with his beast was already so strong that you could barely differentiate between him and the demon inside him at the Chunin exams. But that's not the point right now, the point is that Akatsuki wanted to capture us and extract these demons, killing us, the hosts in the process. Naruto explained waiting patiently for everyone to recover from their shock. And no way. I don't be believe it. I, I refuse to be believe that N Naruto-kun is the QB, Hinata said on the verge of tears. It's true Hinata-chan. Think about it, why do you think everyone in the village hates me so much? Take a look around you, see for yourself how the people passing by are looking at me, Naruto said, all the rookie ten looking around and confirming much to their astonishment just how real and how strong the village's hate was towards Naruto. Naruto. Shino trailed off. Yes? How long have you known that you are the QB? Shino asked curiously. I found out on the night of the graduation exam, Mizuki Sensei told me just before he tried to kill me. I defeated him though, and he's in jail now, Naruto said as if this was the most normal thing in the world, completely ignorant, or at least feigning ignorance to the sheer magnitude of the info that he was distributing and the terror it wrought on his comrades. And no way. I refuse to believe anything you say, Sakura exclaimed with her eyes closed shaking her head vehemently in denial, almost as if to wish away the information from her mind. It's true. Mizuki Sensei convinced me that I could get a Janon promotion if I stole the Forbidden Scroll of Seals and managed to learn a Jutsu from it, that's how I learned the Shadow Clone technique. He gave me a location for us to rendezvous just outside the village. He was actually secretly working for Orochimaru. He planned to kill me when we rendezvous and then take the scroll back to Orochimaru. You all know that I failed the Academy promotion exam. But you all saw me the next day with a headband and I was allocated a team. My feat of stealing the scroll, learning the shadow clone, and defeating Mizuki is what earned me the promotion, and the achievement was recorded in my record as an A rank mission. Naruto continued, giving his comrades a few moments to take in the information before carrying on. Anyway, you know everything now except for how exactly I got my Chunin promotion. The thing is, Tsunade sama refused to let me go on the mission on the grounds I listed earlier that being a possible enemy or Akatsuki trying to lure me into a trap. She's a gambling addict so I managed to get her to make a bet with me. The deal was that she would give me a Chunin promotion and allow me to go on the mission if I passed any test that she wished to set up for me. The condition was that I would have four months to prepare. I was training in the forest of death and also living there for the last four months. Lee knows this because he and Guy Sensei helped me out with my taijutsu, stamina, speed, and strength training. Of course I made them promise not to tell anyone where I was or what I was doing. Naruto added hastily, saving Lee from a world of hurt from Tenten, Ino, and Sakura, who he was sure by the looks on their faces that they would have done unspeakable things to him if he hadn't added that piece of information at the end. Anyway, the water fox you saw was my technique, a technique I used to defeat Gamakan, the giant toad that you all saw. That was part of the test. 
Originally I was meant to fight Kakashi Sensei and get two bells from his waist, but Jiraiya Sensei for one reason or another changed the test and had it that I either had to defeat Gamakan or last for 24 hours against him. I was also not allowed to use my demon powers to win. What demon powers? Sakura asked with a terrified expression. Um, didn't I just tell you that I'm the QB? Naruto asked with a sweat drop, but I've never seen you use demon powers before? The only demon I ever saw was Gara. Sakura argued vehemently, still apparently in denial mode Naruto realized. I used demonic chakra to defeat Haku in Wave Island, and I used demonic chakra to defeat Neji in the Chunin exams. I also used them against Orochimaru in the Forest of Death and against both Gara and Sasuke at the Valley of the End. I used the most against Sasuke, my body even transformed partially in a way similar to what you saw from Gara, and I had a one-tailed demonic chakra cloak surrounding me. I've used a lot of demon chakra Sakura, you just haven't noticed yet. Naruto retorted, a shocked silence the only response he got from her, her mouth wide agape from information overload. Anyway, there was supposed to be a test to see if I can use a three-tailed chakra cloak without losing control. What do you mean by losing control? Neji asked wearily. The demonic chakra is full of malicious intent, it has its own will so to speak. Or rather, it has the Kyuubi's will. The Kyuubi is the incarnation of hate itself. So whenever I use his chakra, my thoughts and emotions become subject to his influence, my whole personality can change during the use of the demonic energy. If I use more than I can control, I could lose myself to hate and attack everyone in sight, including comrades. Worst case scenario is that I make a full transformation and the QB takes over me completely, in other words, the QB could be reborn, Naruto said, not pulling anything back as he spilled out all the beans to his former classmates. And no way. That can't be possible. Ino argued, fear and astonishment clearly written all over her facial features. It is unfortunately possible. However, the fourth was the greatest seal master in the world, he probably has a fail safe of some sort installed in the seal. I'm still a novice at sealing arts though so I haven't been able to discern much about the seal, but I'll figure it out sometime and who knows, I might become skilled enough to install my own fail safe sometime in the future. Naruto said reassuringly, no offense Naruto but I'm told the sealing arts require more intellectual and cultured mind in order to master. Tenten trailed off. You're still underestimating me after everything that you've heard? Naruto retorted. Um, well, I, okay, I'm sorry, Tenten said apologetically, even though she and everyone else still doubted Naruto could surpass the fourth in any field whatsoever. It's okay, I forgive you, Naruto said with a small smile. Um, thanks. Tenten replied awkwardly, a small red hue forming on each one of her cheeks. Silently wondering when Naruto became so handsome and alluring, or mature for that matter. Naruto. Kiba trailed off with a rare serious tone. What is it? Naruto asked with a quirked eyebrow. When exactly are you leaving for your mission? Kiba asked curiously. Tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. Naruto lied through his teeth once again. He was actually leaving to join the Yanbu at 2 a.m. But he knew that his cover story would be in jeopardy if his friends decided that they would see him off before his departure a departure which wasn't going to actually take place since he would still be inside the village for quite some time still for his Anbu and more specifically, Hunter Nin training. He didn't really believe anyone would see him off, but he had to be vigilant, there was absolutely no margin for error. His friends would be told part of the truth if they did try to see him off, that his mission departure was actually 2 o'clock in the morning, but of course, they would remain ignorant about the true nature of his mission if the Hokage was a woman of her word. 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon? Man how troublesome, you're always making things troublesome for everyone Naruto, your life itself is just troublesome, Shikamaru said in exasperation. He he he. I guess so. Anyway, I have to go and make preparations you know, people to say goodbye to, clothing and weapons to pack, strategies to prepare, etc etc, Naruto said walking through and past his friends and comrades. Where do you think you're going Naruto? You're coming with us to see Tsunade-sama and we're going to get to the bottom of this nonsense. Don't forget that you made a promise to me. Besides, it's not like you have a family to say goodbye to. Sakura ranted in frustration, everyone's heart in their mouths at Sakura's last statement, even Ino unable to believe just how insensitive her best friend could be. Naruto stopped too abruptly at Sakura's words, even he caught a little off guard by his teammates' cruel, selfish, and insensitive behavior, a tense silence permeating the atmosphere in that moment. It's true that I don't have a family. But there are people that have earned a special place in my heart like Konohamaru, Moegi, Udon, Ayame Nechan, and Tuchioji san I'd like to spend some time with them before I go. Is that too much to ask, Sakura? Naruto replied emotionlessly. I don't care for your excuses. You know what, 
Fine, whatever, you've always been selfish and unreliable anyway. That's why Sasuke-kun, that's enough Sakura, Kakashi exclaimed from the entrance of the Hokage building, a great amount of killing intent directed at his only female student in that moment. K. Kakashi-sensei, when did you? Hokage-sama wants to have a word with you, all of you except Naruto. I'd suggest you don't keep her waiting. Kakashi ordered viciously, but Sensei Naruto, God I'm Sama will explain everything in detail. Leave Naruto out of this, he has enough to deal with already. Has enough to deal with? What, you think I don't have any emotions? Why is Naruto getting special treatment just because he's the... Stop right there Sakura, Naruto said hastily. What did you say to me? Sakura asked with a threatening undertone. I forgot to tell you guys. Only the Hokage and I are permitted to disclose information about my status as A the QB's host. Otherwise it is an S-ranked secret of which speaking of without permission from either the Hokage or I to someone who doesn't already know, or in such a manner that someone who doesn't already know can overhear you, is punishable by death. Naruto said dramatically, the wind, almost as if sensing the tension, blowing harder and causing a strong breeze to whisk through the silence. Keep that in mind from here on out, Naruto said as he resumed his journey away from his friends, teammate, and sensei. The blonde calmly walking away with his hands in his pockets. Where do you think you're going? We're not. Sakura trailed off as Naruto ignored her completely, the blonde Uzumaki disappearing in a spiraling water-style sunshine technique, the water spiraling around his body and then evaporating immediately, along with Naruto's body it would appear as he was no longer there anymore. And Naruto, Sakura exclaimed in frustration, she's really not taking any of this well. Perhaps Naruto shouldn't have revealed so much at the same time. She's clearly struggling to process everything that's going on. It's almost like she's developing abandonment issues with Sasuke and now Naruto leaving. The next three years or so are probably going to be some of the toughest of her shinobi career, it will probably be a make-or-break experience. Kakashi thought analytically. One year later, it's 11.55 right now, my daughter's life is in jeopardy, do we really have to wait for this mysterious hunter nin of yours while my daughter is in enemy territory? Tsume asked in frustration. Standing in a small clearing just outside the village along with a boar-masked Anbu operative, the Anbu commander in fact, who spotted spiky brown hair and dark eyes under that mask of his, along with the standard Anbu gear, complete with metal-plated armor and a tanto across the back. Also present and visibly unsettled was Kamiko, a very big and strong-looking black ninja dog with gold-slitted pupils and extremely sharpened teeth and claws. Kamiko was actually one of Hana's three Ninkan. She was the one that Hana had sent to call for backup because she was the fastest out out of the three. Hana was stuck in Karagakur no Sato because she had run into a former swordsman of the mist, Kurosuke Raiga, who was also a wielder of the lightning fangs. She and her team had been sent on a mission to assassinate the rogue swordsman because he had been burying villagers alive on a small settlement near the border of Fire Country. But either Raiga was stronger than they were lead to believe or the rogue swordsman had improved his skills drastically since he went rogue because Hana was the only living survivor of her four men's cell and even she had to admit that she would have been dead if it weren't for her teamwork with the Ninkan. Kamiko had explained to Tsume that she believed that Raiga had intentionally driven Hana towards Karagakur no Sato, for what reason she didn't know why. But Tsume understood perfectly what Raiga had in mind and it was quite a simple strategy if one thought about it. Raiga didn't want anyone interfering with him and his prey, a sentiment that Tsume, as an Inuzuka, understood too well. It didn't matter if Hana managed to call for backup because international law prevented Konoha Shinobi from entering water country without permission from either the water daimyo or the Mizukage and their delegates, and given the state that Kiri was in at the moment, chances of receiving approval were close to negative 100%. If Konoha sent a large or even small task force to water country, and said task force was discovered, war would almost certainly become inevitable. Neither the Hokage or the Anbu commander could be expected to risk a full-blown war for a single woman, even if said woman was an heiress of one of Konoha's most prestigious clans. Tsume understood that perfectly well, and even agreed with the sentiment, but that didn't mean that she wasn't hurt or anxious about the situation, what mother wouldn't. She'd almost given up but her tears, much as she hated how weak she felt because of them, were enough to get the Hokage and the Anbu commander to give her a glimmer of hope, a glimmer of hope that was vested in a single hunter nin shinobi who was said to be the most skilled and most powerful of said division and had a 100% success rate. More importantly, it was said that he had an in-depth understanding of Kiri's tactics, geography, and ninjutsu. It was said that if anyone could go in and out of Kiri without getting caught, then it was this particular individual. He said he would be here at noon, there are still five minutes left. Do not be anxious about his timing, he has never been late for any meeting before, I don't expect him to start today. Bor replied calmly, 
even though even he had to admit he was a little intimidated by the Inuzuka Matria, he honestly didn't know if he could win against her if she lost her cool and assaulted him. She was an experienced and professional Kunoichi, he knew that well enough, but he doubted that she'd had to deal with something like this before and that didn't change the fact that her core nature was that of a savage animal. He was really hoping that Red Fox wouldn't choose today of all times to be late for the first time in his Anbu career. You really believe in this guy don't you? Tsume stated with a curious tone. God I'm Sama ordered that I personally handle his Anbu training for various reasons that are not to be discussed, so I know better than anyone else out there what he is capable of. He's a very scary guy, in fact, he reminds me a lot of Uchiha Itachi, of course, before anyone knew just how evil and sadistic he actually was. Bor replied with a somewhat proud tone. Well, if he also goes crazy, I hope it only happens after Hanachan has been returned to her rightful place by my side. Tsume replied with a small chuckle. Don't joke about that. Konoha's extinction would become almost inevitable if such a thing happened. Bor retorted nervously. Okay okay that's enough. You don't have to exaggerate this guy's abilities so much just to make me feel better about the situation. I'm not exaggerating anything Tsume-sama. I'm totally serious. Bor replied causing a very confused expression to morph into Tsume's facial features, unable to believe that such a person would exist without her being any wiser about it, only to be broken out of her thoughts by Kamiko's loud bark, looking in front of her only for her eyes to witness Red Fox in his glorious presence, a young man, looking no older than 14 if Tsume were to judge by size alone, walking towards the two of them calmly, the man wearing a white onbu mask with a fox head painted in red over his mask black shinobi sandals with white tape around the ankles, and a long, plain white, hooded cloak. A white cloak? That is the outfit reserved for the highest ranked and most powerful member of each Anbu division. But he doesn't look that old, or is it a man of small stature? More importantly, why does this man have no scent? Even from this distance I can barely smell anything from him. Tsume thought analytically, not liking one bit of that aspect. A man who had no scent, to her clan, was a very dangerous person, a demon even because it meant that this man could neither be tracked down or identified. It meant that even if someone killed him and another posed as him, she and her clan members wouldn't be able to identify the deception, and most importantly, that her clan was almost completely vulnerable to such a man. Good afternoon, Bortaiku, Tsume-sama. The cloaked Anbu greeted with a respectful bow, his voice easily identifiable to Tsume as that of young teenager, definitely not of a fully grown man just as she suspected. Good afternoon Red Fox. How was your mission? Bor asked diplomatically. It was a success. There will be no rehabilitation for this individual, I killed her. Red Fox replied, I see. That's quite unfortunate, but good job nonetheless. I know it is against protocol for you to deliver evidence in any place other than my office, but this is an exceptional circumstance. You need to leave immediately because we have an urgent mission for you. It is probably the most important and difficult mission you have ever had before. Bor explained, I understand. Here. The evidence of my success is in this scroll. Red Fox replied, handing a sealing scroll over to his superior. Thank you, Red Fox. Bor replied, no need to thank me. Just doing my job. Why don't you rather give me the details of this new mission? Red Fox requested. You already know who this is next to me apparently, so I won't go into that. What's important is that you have to eliminate Kurosuke Raga the Swordsman of the Mist, and bring back Inuzu Kahana while you're at it, preferably alive and well. Right now she is either fleeing from Raiga, battling Raiga, is captured by Raiga, or has been killed by Raiga. Whichever the case may be, you must bring her back and you absolutely must assassinate Raiga. He has killed a lot of innocent Fire Country civilians, burying them six feet under while they are still alive and breathing. Bor explained patiently. Okay, I understand. But tell me, do you know where they were last seen and where they might be? Also, is there anything you can tell me about Raiga other than what is in the bingo book? Red Fox asked curiously. Only that Raga is stronger than what we imagined, in other words, a stronger and better version of what is in the bingo book. As for where they were headed, that is the real issue, the real reason why your expertise became a requirement. Bor explained. Go on, Red Fox said simply. Raga seems to have driven his prey towards Karagakur no Sato. We suspect that he is an adapt sensor type because according to Kamiko, Hana couldn't lose him no matter what she did and he stopped every attempt she made to run in any direction other than towards Karagakur, or rather, Water Country. Kamiko will accompany you to where the battle took place and she will help you track them down. The other two of Hana's three Ninkan stayed behind and they will leave scent markings for you two to follow. Your own chakra sensing along with Kamiko's scent tracking should be sufficient for the mission. Bor carried on. So this Ninkan is Kamiko huh? 
Red Fox asked, bending down and scratching Kamiko behind the ear, Kamiko taking an instant liking to the young hunter Nin, so much so that she practically jumped into his embrace, Red Fox embracing and comforting the Blackford Ninkin. I don't believe this? Hana's Ninkin have never warmed up to any stranger before, actually, they have never warmed up to any other Inuzuka even, yet this young man who doesn't even have a scent is able to invoke such a reaction? What sorcery is this? Tsume thought in disbelief. Don't worry Kamiko-chan, we'll definitely save Hana-san okay? Red Fox said comfortingly, earning an excited bark from the canine creature. J just who are you exactly? Tsume demanded. I'll tell you when I reunite you and Hana-san again. For now, just know that everyone in Konoha is part of my extended family, so this isn't just a mission to me. I want to bring Hana-san back alive more than anything right now. I will carry those feelings as I conduct myself in this mission. Red Fox replied causing Tsume's eyes to widen in surprise before settling on a genuine and touched smile. Okay. I'll leave everything to you then, Red Fox-san. Tsume replied, Thank you, Tsume-sama. Now please excuse us, I don't want to waste any more time. Is there anything else you want to tell me, Bortaiku? Red Fox asked. Yes there is actually. Failure might possibly lead to a full-blown war. I'm sure I don't need to tell you the reason for this though. So with that said, good luck. Bor said sternly. Thank you, Red Fox said with a respectful bow. Let's go Kamiko-chan, Red Fox said, Kamiko barking in response as the two prepared to leave. Wait Kamiko-chan. I have a message for my daughter when you see her again, Tsume said hastily, bending down to whisper something in Kamiko's ear before stepping back with an accomplished smirk plastered on her facial features, a mischievous look morphing into her eyes as she watched the two disappear into the forest. That is quite a mysterious young pup. Do you perhaps know why he doesn't have a scent? Tsume asked curiously. I was unaware that he didn't have a scent. Why didn't you ask him when he was here just now? Bor asked in surprise. I didn't want to waste any more time than we have already wasted. But maybe I'll ask him when he returns, Tsume said with a mysterious look in her eyes, Bor wondering what on earth was on this incredible but not so sane Kunoichi's mind. Three days later, Water Country, this area is dangerously close to the Bloodline Rebellion Force's main base Naruto-kun. Keep that in mind as we proceed. Haku said with a warning tone. Roger that. Red Fox or rather, Naruto replied professionally, his chakra senses having detected where their targets were, both of them, which was a good thing because it meant that Hana was still alive and well, after all, his chakra sensing abilities would have been useless if she wasn't alive. He'd never encountered Raiga before and therefore there was no way he could have identified his chakra signature, but he'd met Kamiko-chan and Tsume-sama. The two Ninkan with Hana were Kamiko-chan's twin siblings, together they were a litter of triplets, and Hana was Tsume's daughter. This meant that Naruto could identify their chakra signatures by virtue of familial relation, such was the level of his chakra sensing prowess. Follow me Kamiko-chan. Naruto ordered as he shunshined towards where the final showdown between Hana and Raiga was about to take place, the blonde Uzumaki and his Ninkan companion arriving just in time to see both Hana and Raiga about to use their strongest techniques. Combination transformation. Cerberus, Hana exclaimed furiously, Naruto mesmerized and even aroused beyond comprehension by the beastly yet elegantly beautiful woman before his eyes, her elongated canine teeth, her dark and slitted eyes, her razor-sharp claws, and her incredible womanly curves, just everything about her captivating him to no end. Fortunately for him, he was able to break out of his arousal-induced trance thanks to her combination transformation technique. Gone was the woman of his dreams and gone were her Ninkan replaced by a ferocious pitch-black and gigantic three-headed dog, something that also captivated and impressed Naruto, as it reminded him of his fox-like transformation when he uses his four-tailed mode. She seems like the perfect fit for you whichever way you look at it, Haku said asmusedly. Now is hardly the time for such thoughts Haku. Naruto replied, you're right. I should be asking you why you're just standing there and not doing anything. Haku retorted, I don't think I should interfere. I believe she can win this fight, or at least get a stalemate. I'll only interfere if it seems like she is not going to make it. I don't want to undermine her courage and perseverance, and I don't want to take away this experience from her. It is as you once taught me, that these close run-ins between life and death are what develops a shinobi's spiritual energy, and therefore what makes you mentally, emotionally, and physically stronger as a shinobi. Let's believe in her shall we?" Naruto replied, My my, you've grown up so much Naruto-kun. I'd be so proud right now if I were your older brother. Haku said with a genuine smile. You are my brother you dumbass. You are my mentor too, so there's no reason for you not to feel proud. Naruto replied, putting Haku into a stunned silence, 
though not having the time or the chance right now to inquire about that as things heated up on the battlefield. I'm not running away from you anymore you slimy bastard. And I will never submit to you. The head in the middle exclaimed in a voice and language that was obviously Hanas, because the Ninkan couldn't speak in human tongue and it made sense that she was the headquarters of the Jutsu, no pun intended. Ooh hoo 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 You make my blood boil you feisty woman. You're going to give me wonderful and strong babies. I'll make you mine forever and ever. He he he. Where the fuck has a woman like you been all my life, Raiga exclaimed with elation, a truly demented expression etched onto his facial features as he channeled almost all of his chakra into the lightning fangs. You sick twisted bastard. Allow me to end your miserable existence. Rotating fang, Hana exclaimed as she rolled in midair, creating a buzzsaw-like vacuum effect as all the air was sucked into her and served to sharpen her form to the maximum, flying at breakneck speeds towards the clinically insane swordsman. Lightning Dragon Technique Raiga exclaimed with his swords facing towards the sky, a bolt of lightning falling from the sky and into his swords, Raiga then pointing his sword towards Hana and releasing a gigantic dragon made out of electricity, the two jutsu clashing together in a violent storm of destruction and carnage. Inchly it seemed like no one would be able to get an advantage, but that was just a momentary setback for Hana, whose jutsu eventually pushed the lightning dragon backwards before shredding right through it. To say Raiga was surprised would be a massive understatement, however, Thanks to his experience, Raiga was able to almost instantly recover, the swordsman, in record time, executing another one of his prized techniques, using the lighting armor to both protect himself and counter-attack against Hana. Raiga's version of a lightning armor was significantly different from the one the Rakage and his predecessors used. Raiga's version was composed of pure lightning drawn from the sky, and it required him to connect the kibas together to form one long and double-edged weapon and then spin around rapidly creating a vortex of lightning around himself. In all honesty, Raiga's naming was a bit off one had to say, as this was more like a lightning shield than a lightning armor. Nevertheless, Hana's jutsu and Raiga's lightning armor were evenly matched, but only because the power and speed of Hana's jutsu had been reduced and slowed down by Raiga's lightning dragon, the shield and the buzz saw cancelling each other out in such a way that it caused an implosion and explosion of energy at the same time. The result was a backlash that was so strong that Hana and her Ninkan were separated from each other the beast transformation cancelling out and sending them flying miles and miles away, their bodies crashing through one three after another and killing all three of them in the process, at least that's what would have happened had Naruto and his shadow clones not used the Shunpono Jutsu and caught them in his arms, effectively saving all three of them from a horrible fate. The Fu Uten, Shunpono Jutsu, otherwise known as the Wind Style, Flash Step Technique was a Jutsu on Naruto's own creation. The theory behind it was simple enough. All you were required to do was to enhance your shunshine with your wind style manipulation. However, that was far easier said than done when it came to the actual mechanics behind the jutsu and application there too. It required that you use your wind style to eliminate the air pressure and air resistance around your body while activating and utilizing the shunshine technique, which once again, was far easier said than done. At the same time it was necessary to enhance the explosive speed of your shunshine with your Fuutin manipulation. The elimination of air pressure and air resistance was not only responsible for further increasing the speed of the jutsu, nor was it only for maximizing Naruto's reaction time and swiftness of movement, it was also the reason why the jutsu was so deathly silent, which is why it was such a useful jutsu for assassinating targets, something that was part and parcel of Naruto's occupation as a hunter nin. Raiga also would have been killed by the recoil effect from the explosion had Naruto's shadow clone not caught him. However, the intention was not to save his life but rather to save the life of the being inside the bag that he carried on his back as Naruto wanted to thoroughly investigate and understand the situation before anything else. He might need to interrogate Raiga to get a clear picture of what was happening. W what the hell is this? Who the fuck are you? And where did you come from? Raiga snapped, on his knees and gasping for air as a result of the energy he had used up the injuries from the explosion, and the seal markings spreading rapidly all over his body. I am a Konoha Hunter Nin, I go by the alias Red Fox. Naruto replied as he carried the unconscious Hana bridal style until he was only two meters away from the demented swordsman, his two other clones standing close behind him with the unconscious twin bitches. Don't bother trying to move or channel chakra, that few injutsu won't allow you to do either, Naruto said, only to be cut off by a vicious spark from Kamiko-chan. Relax Kamiko-chan. I just want to interrogate him that's all. I'll eliminate him soon enough. Naruto explained, causing Kamiko to reluctantly back down. W who or why you? Hana squeezed out tiredly, the Kunoichi showing great resilience as Red Fox did not expect her to regain consciousness so soon. I'm Red Fox, the highest ranked member and representative of Konoha's Hunter Nin division. 
My mission is to eliminate Raga and to ensure your safe return to the village. Naruto replied robotically. Her feral features have mostly reclined, but she still looks incredibly beautiful, even in her currently worn out state. Naruto thought, Haku having to use an insane amount of restraint to refrain from teasing the blonde Uzumaki, sometimes it was quite troublesome to have another person constantly listening to every one of your thoughts. I, I see. I didn't think that they would actually send anyone. Hana replied, You're an important asset to the village, and I can see why the Hokage and Anbu commander think so highly of you. That was without a doubt the most incredible battle I have ever seen. You're an awesome Kunoichi Hana-san. Quite frankly I don't understand why you're still a Chounin, you're without a doubt at the level of an elite Chounin. Naruto replied, causing Hana, despite her current state, to blush shyly, never having ever received that kind of praise before from anyone, more so from a male figure. Um, you don't have to say that just to make me feel better. Hana retorted, I'm serious. I'm actually going to recommend that Godaim Sama give you a Jonin promotion exam as soon as we get home. Naruto replied, causing Hana's eyes to widen in surprise. And no way. You're totally going overboard now. Hana argued defiantly. Really? I don't actually think I'm going overboard. Raiga has an A ranking in the bingo book. That's a ranking reserved for elite Jonin. More importantly, I've been told that he is quite significantly more powerful than he was when the bingo book entry was made. Do you still think I'm going overboard now, Hana-san? Naruto asked rhetorically. Don't worry though, you don't have to take the exam if you don't want to. I'm merely going to make sure that the higher authorities recognize your talent. What you do with it is entirely up to you. Is that okay, Hana-san? Naruto asked softly. H hi. I guess I can't complain when you put it like that. Hana replied with a small and arrogant smirk, causing Naruto to smile happily under his mask. Do you think you can stand? Naruto asked. Why yeah, sure. Hana replied with a light blush, suddenly becoming self-conscious as she realized the full extent of her situation, her clothes so ripped up that certain body parts became accessible to the naked eye and capped off by the position that she had found herself in, as in, the fact that Naruto was holding her as if he was about to throw her on their honeymoon bed and ravage her. Oh 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 Do you hate me for what I just did to Raiga, Ranmaru? Red Fox asked emotionlessly. I'm sad but I don't hate you nor do I want revenge. I knew that Raigasama was not a good person, but he was all I had and he is the only one in the world that didn't look at me with fear or loathing. He is also the only one that gave me the opportunity to see the world, and valued me for what I am. I could have stopped him from doing all the bad things, I could have stopped him for good, but I didn't do it because I didn't want to be lonely. I'm so selfish, I deserve the same fate as Raigasama, Ranmaru said without blinking. Neither Naruto or Hana able to sense any negative emotions from him except maybe self-loathing. What are you going to do now, Red Fox-san? Hana asked fearfully, her heart crying out for the young boy in front of her despite the fact that he had contributed to the deaths of so many people, including her teammates. Still, she couldn't bring herself to hate the young boy in front of her after hearing his story, and she certainly didn't want to see him die. I haven't decided yet. He says that he doesn't hate us nor does he want revenge for Araiga. I believe him but that's not enough for me to make a decision yet. I need you to answer a question first. Naruto trailed off. Me? What do you want to ask me? Hana asked with a confused expression. Hana-san? Do you hate Ranmaru? Do you want revenge against him? And do you want him to die? Naruto asked with a stern and no-nonsense voice. Oh, of course not. He's just as much a victim as I am. I hated Raiga and I wanted revenge against him, and I got it. I, I don't want this child to die. But I also can't stop you from killing him, it's your job and your mission," Hana said with a tearful expression. Actually, my job is to eliminate threats to the village and my mission was to eliminate Raiga. Ranmaru is not a threat to the village and he was not my target. Naruto replied, causing both Hana and Ranmaru's eyes to widen in surprise, but for different reasons completely. No. You can't do that. You have to kill me. Smack. Was the sound of Naruto smacking Ranmaru right across the face. Both he and Hana once again shocked into silence by Naruto's behavior. I know why you want to die, but listen to my proposal first and then make an informed decision. A proposal? What kind of proposal? Ranmaru muttered under his breath. I have the ability to heal any injuries and any disabilities, in other words, I can give you your legs again. But I have a condition. Naruto trailed off, for the third time now shocking both Hana and Ranmaru to no end. W what is your condition Red Fox-san? Ranmaru asked. Naruto smirking inside his mask at the fact that Ranmaru was at least considering his offer. First let me tell you something about me. I too have faced scorn, fear, and hatred all of my life. 
simply because I was and am different from other people. That's not true. Konoha don't have bloodline massacres and everybody loves bloodline clans in Konoha. Ranmaru argued vehemently. What you say is indeed true. However, the reason bloodline clans are hated in Kiri is because they are believed to be of demonic origin. Humans hate demons with a passion wherever you go Ranmaru. In your case it was a case of mistaken identity or lack of understanding, in my case, I really am a demon. Naruto explained much to his company's surprise and Kamiko chan's protests. And no way. Ranmaru trailed off with a shocked expression. It's true, inside of me lives the nine-tailed demon fox that attacked Konoha 14 years ago. The Ondame Hokage sealed it inside of baby in order to stop it and create a military weapon for the village. That baby was me. Naruto trailed off, taking a slight pause before continuing where he left off. You understand now Ranmaru? The fox killed a lot of parents, children, siblings, lovers, and friends during its rampage. That's why everyone in the village hates me and wants nothing more than for me to die. The teachers at the Ninja Academy also hated me and they did everything they could to sabotage my educational development. One of them even tricked me into stealing the Forbidden Scroll of Seals so that he can have a legitimate reason to assassinate me. Fortunately I defeated him. Naruto explained, Why are you telling me this? Ranmaru asked with a confused expression. I want you to understand that you are not the only one that has had a painful childhood, that you can't give up on life just because of that. You have to fight and fight and fight, to fight on until the very end. You have to defy this reality with everything you have and forge your own path. You have to use your own strength to make life what you want it to be, to change your destiny or rather, to create your own destiny, Naruto said passionately. H how do I do that? Please tell me Red Fox San. Ranmaru pleaded desperately. It's your choice at the end of the day, but I have an idea. You see, there is too much pain and suffering in the world, too much hatred, too much fighting and too much evil. I want to do something about that, to prevent future wars and to bring forth a long-lasting, hopefully everlasting peace to the world. Of course, I can't create a peaceful world if I can't even create a peaceful ninja village and country, and I can't do even that without attaining a position of power. You want to become the Hokage? Ranmaru exclaimed in surprise. You catch on fast Ranmaru, but yes, I do want to become the Hokage, it is my lifelong dream. But before I do that I have to completely tame and control the nine-tailed demon fox's power so that I can earn some form of trust from the shinobi, and I have to get that civil aid population to acknowledge me and see that I am not a demon. That's going to be hard, but I will not give up until I achieve that goal, which brings us to Yuranmaru. Naruto trailed off with a grave undertone. What about me? Ranmaru asked fearfully. You are blessed with amazing talent. You don't even have shinobi training yet your chakra capacity and control is jonin level. You also have a dojutsu that seems to combine the prowess of Konoha's Sharingan and Byakugan's abilities. And more importantly, you are a kind-hearted young man who knows true pain and suffering, hence the ability to empathize with others. You've also got a great amount of battle experience from being Raga's eyes and ears for so long. Ranmaru, you have the potential to become the trump card of the Bloodline Rebellion faction of Kiri and become a future Mizukage, Naruto said convincingly. And no way, you can't be serious. Ranmaru argued, I'm dead serious Ranmaru. You can receive swordsman training from the Bloodline faction and become a member of the Seven Ninja Swordsman organization. You already have the Lightning Fangs now and you know better than anyone alive how to use them as you've fought side by side with Raiga for years now. Think about it, you have one of the most powerful Bloodlines that I have ever seen, you have intellect and maturity beyond your age, you have Jonin level chakra capacity and control, and you have the Lightning Fangs in the Bloodline faction to support you. If you defeat Yagura and help the Bloodline faction retake control of Kiri, then you will be able to end all the pain and suffering in Kiri. You will become a hero that will eventually become the Mizukage. Naruto explained, taking a small pause before carrying on where he left off. Suna has finally elected a new Kaze Kage. He is a demon host just like me. He was also hated in the past but now he has won everyone's respect and acknowledgement. He is also one of my closest friends. If the three of us become leaders of our respective villages, then Kiri, Konoha, and Suna will never have to go to war again. We'll make sure our kids become friends and we'll train them to become strong and carry on the family tradition. Kumo and Iwa will not touch either one of us because we'll outnumber them and they won't fight each other either for fear of either of us sweeping in to take spoils of war. Peace will be ensured for generations to come. Naruto carried on, taking another deep breath of air before finishing off. It's not going to be easy, and there's no guarantee that things will go as smoothly as they sound. We might have to improvise and adjust our plans at times, but what do you say, Ranmaru? Even if we fail, it's better to die fighting than lying on your back isn't it? Naruto asked, 
extending his right hand in what could and should be interpreted as a welcoming gesture. R. Red Fox San, you really think we can do something like that? You really think I can become Mizukagi? Ranmaru asked disbelievingly. Without a shadow doubt. I've seen you in action and I've heard your story. You have all the potential in the world, probably even more than I all it takes is to believe in yourself and to be vigilant at all times. If you combine those two traits with your immense talent, then the world is your oyster. Naruto said encouragingly, Ranmaru adopting a thoughtful expression before coming to a decision, resolve clearly written all over his eyes and facial expression. I'll do it. I'll join the bloodline faction and I'll do my best. Even I'm not the one to land the finishing blow, I'll make sure that Yagura goes down. Ranmaru reaffirmed with a determined look in his eyes, one that disappeared very quickly however as he remembered something important. Um, Red Fox San? Ranmaru trailed off nervously. What is it, Ranmaru? Naruto asked curiously. I don't know your name yet, and I can't see your face even with my dujutsu. Um, so, I was wondering if you could. Oh. My apologies Ranmaru, I forgot about that. You see, my friends don't know that I have joined the Anbu, they believe that I have gone on a long-term mission. Two of those friends are from the Hyuga clan, and therefore, just like you, are blessed with telescopic and x-ray vision. As a result, I invented a new seal specifically to counter the effects of x-ray vision and placed it on the inside of my mask. That's why you can't see my face. Naruto explained. That's amazing Red Fox San. To think that someone could create something like that with ninjutsu, Ranmaru said with childlike exuberance. Hee <laughs> hee. It's actually known as fuinjutsu, but sometimes there's a very thin line between the two. Anyway Ranmaru, my name is Uzumaki Naruto, pleased to meet your acquaintance. Naruto replied as he removed his hood and mask with his left hand, his right hand extended towards the seated youngster, the two exchanging handshakes for the first time since they met. Wow you look so young Red F, I mean Naruto-san. I thought you were a bit older, Ranmaru exclaimed in surprise. Hey cut it out with the honorific Stata by O, we're friends now, so you can just call me Naruto okay? Naruto said with a kind smile. F friends? I've never had a friend before. Ranmaru trailed off with a forlorn expression, tears falling down his cheeks against his will as he came to that heartbreaking realization. Hey now, you're still only 10 years old. It's not too late to make friends you know. I'm sure you'll make more friends in the bloodline rebellion forces and everyone will admire and respect you when you become the Maizuke. Naruto trailed off, his eyes widening slightly as he sensed 19 strong chakras more roughly 150 kilometers away. What's wrong Naruto? Hana asked curiously, Naruto getting startled just a little, almost forgetting that Hana and her Ninkan were even present, partly because he'd been so preoccupied with Ranmaru and also because they had been so silent the whole time. There are 19 people with strong chakra closing in on us at incredible speed. Three of them are particularly strong. Naruto explained much to the displeasure of the Inuzuka heiress, but I can't sense or see anything. Ranmaru argued, I see. I didn't realize you were also a sensor type. But it seems like your range with both your chakra sensing and your visual prowess is shorter than my sensing range. In any case you should be able to perceive their location soon enough with your sensing skills. For now, let me heal both of you and the Ninkan so that we can be better prepared to deal with the possible threat. Naruto said hastily. How are you going to completely heal us up in such a short space of time? We still wouldn't have enough time even if your sensing radar was 60 kilometers. I think it would be better if we ran straight for fire country and worry about healing injuries later. Hana argued logically. The people I sensed were 150 kilometers away when I detected them, my range is much longer when I put all of my focus on sensing, but 150 is my limit when I am not particularly focused on that. Naruto explained so that Hana may understand that they had more time than she thought, and also so that Ranmaru may understand why he couldn't see the potential enemy as there was no way that his dujutsu could see that far. I find it hard to believe that anyone could sense that far with 100% focus, never mind passively as you suggest you did. But let's say you did, what difference does it make? There is still no way that even Goddaim Sama could fix this kid's problem in that short span of time. We are not even sure this kid's problem can be fixed. Hana persisted. My my you're such an intelligent and headstrong woman Hana-san, however just like everyone else I've met before, you're severely underestimating me. Naruto retorted with a an expression that told Hana that he definitely knew something that she didn't. What do you mean? Hana asked with narrowed eyes wondering at the back of her mind why she was wasting so much precious time arguing over this whereas the obvious solution to their problem was the one she already suggested. First of all, how do you think these people located us from that far away, and how do you think I know that they are coming for us even from that distance? Naruto asked rhetorically, 
causing Hana's eyes to widen slightly in surprise as that was something she had not really considered in her haste to get away. Perhaps it wasn't just her body alone that was worn out by her fight with Raiga after all. I get the feeling you're going to tell me anyway. Hana retorted cheekily. The reason I was sent after you is because I am the most knowledgeable and well-versed shinobi in Konoha when it comes to water country's geographical locations, climatology, ninjutsu, infrastructure, strategies and tactics, and general way of life. That's why I happen to know that we are in fact in the territory of the bloodline faction, and also that the mist around this whole place is part of their secret barrier technique similar to the one we have surrounding Konoha. The faction's barrier squad detected our chakra as soon as we entered this mist and they probably took their time organizing a particularly strong squad to deal with us because of the strength of our chakras, Naruto said, taking a short breath before elaborating on his explanation. Why aren't we running away? Well, there's a particularly strong chakra in this squad that leads me to believe that the leader of the bloodline faction might be on his or her way here. I want to get to know the person who is going to be taking care of Ranmaru so that I can ascertain if it will be safe to leave Ranmaru in their hands or not. That's all there is to it. I understand if you don't want to stick around after everything you've gone through Hana-san, so I'll have my shadow clones escort you back to Konoha after I heal your injuries, Naruto said with a kind smile. Why are you willing to go so far for this child, I mean? You're an Anbu operative, you could be disgraced if you did something outside the scope of your mission and it backfired. Hana asked with a confused and concerned expression at the same time. I told you I wanted to become the Hokage right? Yeah, so? Hana asked. Well, I believe that I have to start thinking and acting like a Hokage now already if I ever want to become a good Hokage in the future. I have to secure alliances and friendships now already and I have to set things in motion so that I can reach the end result when I become Hokage. I just don't believe it is wise to wait that long to begin my journey. My goal is beyond the Hokage position and beyond Fire Country itself. I want to fix the world, or at least make it a better place and inspire generations to come, generations that will hopefully inherit that same spirit and determination. I can't waste such a good opportunity Hana-san. Naruto replied, I'm sorry, Hana said apologetically, why? Naruto asked, the tables turning on him as he was now the confused one, for doubting you. I thought you were being naive and unrealistic, but I understand now that you're optimistic and realistic at the same time rather than naive and unrealistic. You hope for the best but also plan for the worst. I wanted to ask you what you would do if it turns out the leader of the bloodline faction is not such a good person and won't allow us to leave this land alive, but you've already prepared for that possibility haven't you? Hana asked rhetorically. Off oars. I'd never recklessly put yours or Ron Maru's life in danger. I have a contingency plan for our escape if it becomes necessary. Naruto retorted with a warm smile. Okay, I believe in you. But um, really Naruto-kun, can you really heal us all in such a short time? And what about Ranmaru, I mean, can you fix his problem so quickly? Hana asked skeptically. Yeah, look at this, Naruto said excitedly, opening his right hand to reveal a big red dot with black spirals inside of it on his palm. What's that Naruto-sa, I mean, Naruto-ni-san? Ranmaru asked curiously. This is a sealing technique of my own design. This seal continuously draws out my Yang Chakra and stores it. Yang Chakra or Yang release is associated with life force, healing, longevity, stamina, and physical strength. The Uzumaki clan is known for its Yang release bloodline limit and this seal makes it easier for me to control my bloodline limit for various purposes. With this seal and my bloodline limit, I have attained healing, restoration and recreation abilities superior even to Tsunade of the Sanin, Naruto said proudly. W wow. You're really amazing Naruto Nisan. I wonder if I'll ever become just like you. Ranmaru thought out loud. You don't have to copy me Ranmaru. You'll never reach your full potential if you just copy someone else. Create your own legacy, your own jutsus, and your style, one that suits you and one that is true to who you are, and then find something important that you want to fight for. Only then can you become truly strong. That's what I believe at least. Naruto replied, Hmm, I think you're right. Thanks a lot Naruto-ni, I promise not to forget your teachings, and I'll do my best always, Ranmaru declared passionately. He seemed so happy and carefree. When we first met he had the expression of a weary old man, a man who was ready to die. But now, all hope has been restored in his heart and his eyes have regained their youthful fire. You really are amazing Naruto-kun. To think that you could have such a profound impact on this boy in such a short span of time, Haku said happily. You did the same for me in that forest in Wave Country remember? I guess this makes me a good apprentice, and you an even better mentor. Naruto retorted, the two best friends sharing a mental laugh together, 
Brief as it was as Naruto went straight back to business, not willing to waste any more time than he'd already wasted. Okay guys, I'm going to fix you all now and I'll fill you in on my plan. Securing the future and honoring a promise. Kuchuro of the Seven Ninja Swordsmen, Ao of the Undertaker unit, and Terumi Mei of the Boil and Lava release. I've heard great things about you three but I've never met any of you in person up until now. The honor is mine, Naruto said with a respectful bow of the head, totally confusing Ranmaru and even more so, Inuzu Kahana. To her, Naruto's current behavior was totally unalpha like When he'd been sent to save her, when he'd managed to effortlessly get Kamiko-chan, Kazuko-chan, and Kimiko-chan to respect and even submit to him, when he'd almost effortlessly struck the fear of God into Raga during the short but fruitful interrogation, when he confidently declared his intention to run the village's Hokage, and even his taking lead of the situation and his qb related status, all of these traits have quickly endeared the blonde Uzumaki to the Inuzuka heiress, after all, what sane Inuzuka woman wouldn't be attracted to a goal-driven, strong, domineering and yet caring, loving, and understanding alpha, with all of these thoughts going through her mind, perhaps it wasn't much of a surprise that Hana was left speechless and confused by the uncharacteristic submissiveness on display, although it was entirely possible that her reading of the situation was a tad bit off, after all, submissiveness is more of a mental state, temporal or permanent, it isn't something that can be judged by actions alone because as far as Naruto was concerned, there was nothing submissive about his actions. He was merely giving credit and respect where it's due, and also setting the foundations for the possibly harsh negotiations that were without a doubt set to proceed shortly. And your Konoha's Red Fox, the mysterious Anbu and Hunan an operative who seems to have appeared out of nowhere and taken the shinobi world by storm. I never imagined that you were Ajin Shiriki, though this does explain a lot of things about you. Ao said with a neutral tone and expression, giving nothing away about his emotional state right then there, which was a good thing Mei thought gratefully. She is an extremely sexy and beautiful woman with a powerful aura, spotting a provocative blue outfit and long red hair styled in a herringbone pattern with a top knot and green eyes with one bang covering her right eye. I hope there is a way for us to resolve this without the need for violence. Red Fox is said to be arguably the most powerful Anbu operative in Konoha according to our sources, but we never knew that he was a Jinchuriki. We'll lose a lot of men if he's even half as good at controlling his Baiju as Yagura is, and these are all my strongest men and women too. May thought with trepidation, fully aware of the fact that the Bloodline faction would most likely have absolutely no chance of winning against Yagura without her, Kuchuro, Ao, and the 16 strong comrades that she had brought with her. I made sure to eliminate or capture all of my targets and I've gone to great lengths to keep a low profile, so forgive me for being surprised that you know about me Aosan, but I suppose I shouldn't underestimate the former leader of Kiri's Undertaker unit. Naruto retorted, slightly surprised by the fact that he apparently had a reputation to speak off outside Konoha's Anbu unit. Information and its accuracy is very important for us shinobi, especially when you're in our shoes. Mei replied with an angelic and yet powerful and authoritative voice, which made Naruto even more certain now that she indeed was the leader of the Bloodline Rebellion forces. I suppose you're right. Tell you what, let's forget about that for now, you and I have some business to discuss, that is of course, if I'm correct in assuming that you are the leader of the Bloodline faction of Kiri's Civil War? Naruto said with a questioning undertone. There's nothing to discuss. You're trespassing on our territory and you'll leave Water Country immediately if you know what's good for you. That's all there is to it, nothing more and nothing less. May ordered without even a blink of an eye, resolved to fight Red Fox and his entourage to the death if necessary, after all, she'd come here prepared to face a Jinchuriki when their barrier squad had detected the Konoha Anbu's chakra, although this was a difficult Jinchuriki to the one that she'd come prepared to do battle against, the barrier squad seemingly confusing Naruto's chakra with Yagura's, though in fairness they did warn her that there was some discrepancies regarding what their barrier was detecting. Let me first kindly but respectfully correct you Terumi-san, this is not your territory, Naruto said matter-of-factly much to everyone's confusion and anger too on the part of Terumi Mei. Excuse me? Mei inquired with a deadly tone. Water country is the water daimyo in Mizukage's territory, and it belongs to their people. However, you aren't their people now are you? No, you guys are by international and local law, a terrorist organization with an S-class criminal ranking, not to mention that both the daimyo and the Mizukage expressly and in writing revoked all of your rights and obligations to this land. You don't own anything inside water country. You're just as much a trespasser as I and my comrades are right now, Naruto declared with devastating effect. You better watch your words Mr. Red Fox, don't think for one second that your Baijuu will protect you from my wrath. 
Don't think for one second that you get to insult our integrity and dignity and then get to walk away with your head on your shoulders. May said ferociously, though if Naruto was scared or intimidated, he certainly did well not to show any signs of it, not that it was easy to tell with that menacing mask covering his entire face. Stop bluffing Terumi-san. I'm Konoha's ultimate military weapon and Hana-san over here is the heiress of the Inuzuka clan. What makes you think that Konoha won't take action against you if anything happens to us? Naruto asked rhetorically, causing Mei to grit her teeth in anger and frustration. We have survived everything that has been thrown against us, we've been through hell and back and we are still alive and intact, stronger than ever. We do not fear anything under the sun and the moon. Terumi Mei declared with conviction. You're a smooth talker, and a passionate woman. I can respect that, but let's be honest here Terumi-san, you already have your hands full with Yagura. There is no way that you could survive an onslaught from both Kiri and Konoha. You have no leverage or higher position here, Red Fox declared. You're right, I have no leverage against you, except for the lives of your comrades. May countered fiercely, but I too have the lives of your comrades within my grasp. You, Kujuro and Aosan need no introduction, but based on their chakra levels and the potency of said chakra, I'm quite confident that the other 16 of your comrades are the strongest of your army after you three. How many do you think the Kyuubi Jinchuriki can kill before he is taken down? And how much of a blow will that be to your military strength? Naruto asked rhetorically. So he's also a sensor type, I guess Ao was right after all, not that I really doubted him. May confirmed to herself. Ao had told her that the Jinchuriki in the enemy ranks was also a sensor type, that was because sensors couldn't hide their sensor abilities from each other as long as they were molding chakra. Thus a sensor can immediately tell when another sensor type has detected his or her position. This isn't going anywhere. Was this your grand plan Red Fox? You're just going to trade insults and threats with her until everyone dies of boredom and starvation? Doesn't seem like such a genius plan to me. Hana said mockingly, causing Naruto to strain himself just to hold back a chuckle at Hana's brash, straight to the point, and blunt honest attitude, a quality that he found stangily endearing. That wasn't my plan. I just want us to negotiate on equal terms. It will be easier for her to take advantage of my generosity if she stops trying to strangehold me. Naruto replied for all to hear, including their potential enemy, 16 of which were still hiding behind the mist despite the fact that Naruto had already revealed his knowledge of their existence and whereabouts. Remember Naruto-kun, a hidden mist user can sacrifice the chakra sensing function of the mist in exchange for a signature disruption function. You won't be able to determine their location by chakra alone anymore because they will almost certainly activate this aspect of the jutsu before they attack now that they know for sure that you're a sensor. Haku said with a warning undertone. I know. But they'll have to rely on other means to track us if they do that. They'll probably use scent or sound, most likely sound. Ranmaru has his dujutsu to aid him, his sight won't be disrupted by the mist, Hana has scent sensing and I have my air resistance sensing. We'll be just fine, Naruto replied confidently vowing to Haku that he wouldn't leave anything to chance, shortly after broken from his thoughts by the beautiful goddess Terumi Mei. All right, I'll bite Red Fox Kun, what is it that you want to negotiate about so badly? Mei asked, her curiosity finally getting the better of her. I want you to surrender Rao San's Byakugan over to me. Not gonna happen. Mei cut in smoothly, not even waiting to hear the rest of the blonde Uzumaki's story as she already knew the answer to his proposal. You haven't even heard my offer. Yes I didn't. But I also know that this is our only Byakugan and it is therefore our most precious and important asset. We won't trade it for anything, May declared with finality. Even for a Dujutsu with powers reminiscent of both the Sharingan and Byakugan? Naruto asked with a knowing smirk, though no one could see it under his mask. Is this some kind of joke? May asked incredulously. Show them, Ranmaru. Naruto ordered, the young and newly uncrippled ten-year-old boy immediately activating his Dujutsu his eyes glowing a menacing red as a result. This is Ranmaru's Dujutsu, the Fuingan. Naruto explained. And no way, Ao exclaimed in surprise. What is it thou? Do you know something about this boy's eyes? May asked hastily. Not much, but I do know that there once was a clan in Kiri that had a legendary Dujutsu, a Dujutsu that was Kiri's answer to Konoha's Sharingan and Byakugan in the past. The clan was hunted down and eliminated for its Dujutsu, however, the clan had a secret Jutsu that incinerated the eyes upon death. It was a jutsu placed on each newborn child at birth in order to prevent the enemy from harnessing the eyes for themselves. The clan was hunted down to extinction long before even I was born. I never thought that, 
that someone from that clan had survived. Ao explained much to both Mei and Kujiro's surprise, even his own surprise really as he honestly never expected to ever get the privilege to witness these eyes in person. Well I must admit that I had no idea that Ranmaru's clan had such a bloody history, but all the better because he will reform the clan and make it an even greater force of nature. I initially intended to take Ranmaru back to Konoha with me, but maybe he could be of more use to you than I wouldn't you say Terumi-san? Of course, I want you to be his mentor and I would like Kujiro-san to train him as well. Wait just a minute. I never said that we had a deal, and more importantly, what makes you think you could make those demands even if we were to make a deal with you? Mei retorted, those were not demands but requests. You see this headless corpse behind me? Naruto asked. Yes and? Mei inquired with a confused expression, unable to understand what said corpse had anything to do with what they were currently discussing. That is Kurosuke Raiga's body, and these are the lightning fangs that we confiscated from him, Naruto said, crouching down on one knee and spreading out the scroll that contained the swords before unsealing the swords for Terumi Mei and her entourage to see. Oh. Mei ordered authoritatively, Ao immediately recognizing the command for what it was, that his boss wanted him to verify the legitimacy of the sword using the power of the Byakugan in his left eye socket. Hi, they're the real deal. Those are the lightning fangs. Ao replied, you're sure? Mei asked again. 100% Terumi-sama. Ao replied respectfully. I see. Mei trailed off thoughtfully. Ranmaru is 10 years old but the strength, reserve size, and control that he is over his chakra is Jonin level. His dujutsu affords him X-ray vision, telescopic vision. 360 degree vision, chakra sensing, genjutsu casting and dissection, chakra perception and dissection, and even temporal dujutsu and sensory disruption. Naruto said in order to sway Mei to his point of view as he noticed that she had just adopted a stance that showed that she was in deep thought. He was formerly Raiga's partner, Raiga hit Ranmaru's small body in a bag that he carried on his back and never went anywhere without him. Ranmaru was Raiga's eyes and ears and therefore knows everything there is to know about the lightning fangs and Raiga's sword style. He is without a shadow of doubt the best candidate to wield the dual swords as he has both the talent and battle experience with the swords. Naruto carried on, if you hand over the Byakugan in exchange for these two gifts, you will most definitely be in a better position than you are now. You only have one Byakugan that cannot be passed on. But now you will have instead two fewing and that will be passed on and multiplied through Ranmaru's descendants. You will also have retrieved a powerful asset in the lightning fangs and a skilled wielder for said weapon. Last but not least, I will give you two other gifts after the trade has taken place. One is a gift of knowledge and one is another military asset that will help you in your war against Yagura. Having heard all of that Terumi-san, can you still say that you won't surrender the Byakugan to me? Naruto pressed on. Fairly confident now that it was only a matter of time before she gave in to him, after all, Mei was in a greatly unfavorable situation against the might of Kiri, she could use any bit of help that she could get, and both Naruto and Mei knew that very well. I will accept your terms only if you tell me what the price is for your unhealthy generosity, Mei declared, causing Red Fox to chuckle at the phrase she used to describe his behavior, not that he could blame her for being suspicious of him. Ramaru's dream is to become the Mizukage. I'm aware that you will probably take the seat when you take control of Kirigakur, but at some point in the future you will have to name a successor. I don't like where this is going. Mei trailed off with a fierce tone. Rest assured Terumi Dono, I only request that you give Ranmaru a fair chance just like everyone else. I'm not saying you are obligated to choose him and I'm not saying you will make an enemy of me if you don't. All I ask for is fairness, Naruto said reassuringly. Why do you care so much what happens to the boy? Ao asked suspiciously. Ranmaru's and I are good friends now, what kind of friend vowed I be if I didn't look out for him? Naruto asked rhetorically. Is that really all there is to it? You don't have any other demands. I'm not making any da. Yes yes, requests, are there any more requests, Red Fox-san? Mei bit out testily. As a matter of fact. Naruto trailed off, causing Mei to have to resist the urge to roll her eyes in exasperation. What is it now? Mei demanded impatiently. I would like to negotiate an alliance treaty with you when I become Hokage and you are the Mizukage. The request is simple, that you only hear me out and give my offer fair consideration. The offer will be that of a two-part alliance treaty, a treaty with Kiri as a whole, and a treaty with the Bloodline faction to ensure that Konoha will be able to legally aid the Bloodline faction should another Bloodline genocide take place in the future. Naruto explained much to the faction's surprise, Mei, Kujuro, Ao and even the other 16 elite all unable to understand what this young man's true motives were. I can see that everything I say and do is being treated with extreme caution and more accurately, extreme distrust and suspicion. So I'll tell you why a Konoha Anbu operative is so determined to help your cause. Please do. Maybe out hastily, 
really needing a clear and concise explanation for something that is by all intents and purposes, too good to be true and completely illogical, her inability to accurately read her perceived nemesis thereby frustrating her to no end as this was a character trait and ability she took pride on as leader of the bloodline faction of Kiri's civil war. On the other hand, having received permission to speak, Naruto went on a long speech as he explained his motivations, all the way back to his first meeting with Zabuza and his apprentice and up to the present time and moment. It wasn't that he enjoyed talking so much, in fact, he really didn't enjoy having to talk this much, hence why he took the occupation of a lone hunter and, however, he did realize the importance of transparency in a situation like this. He would never earn Terumi Mei's full confidence, or even partial trust there too if he wasn't completely, or at least as honest as he could be. If she understood who he was, where he came from, and where he was going, if she understood that he was doing this partly to honor Zabuza and Haku's memory, understood what kind of impact they had on his life, why he could sympathize with the faction's plight because of his own history, and finally, why he and Ranmaru were able to become such close friends in such a short time, then it would be much easier for her to accept his generosity. IT thought D that Ichiha Sasuke was the one who de-defeated Zabuza-san. Kuchiro stuttered, speaking for the first time since he arrived Naruto realized, the blonde Uzumaki also surprised by the fact that not only did it seem like he was only interested in Zabuza out of everything that was said, but also because, or rather, especially because he thought Sasuke defeated Zabuza, something that Naruto found to be completely preposterous. I don't know where you got your information from Kuchiro-san but Kakashi-sensei was the one who defeated Zabuza, and I was the one who defeated Haku, though I couldn't have done it without Sasuke's help I have to admit that much at least. Naruto replied, I, I see. Thank you very much, Red Fox-san. Kujiro replied meekly, Naruto wondering how on earth such a timid guy could be a member of the Seven Ninja Swordsmen, but then again, as he recalled, Hinata was also someone with a similar personality yet she had proven herself to be a brave and capable Kunoichi when it really mattered so maybe this guy wasn't so bad after all. No problem. Anyway, Terumi-san, I've told you everything. Now it's your turn, have you come to a decision yet? Naruto asked hopefully. Yes I have. I will accept your offer and the terms and conditions that come with it, but first you have to tell me something, having been part of the team that defeated Zabuza, you should have a good idea of the whereabouts of the Gubi Kibocho. Am I wrong? May asked rhetorically. Indeed. Remember that I said I had two other gifts apart from Ron Maru and the Lightning Fangs, the Kabi Karabocho is one of those gifts. Naruto explained, Okay that settles it, we will now make the trade. I don't need to hear any more. You understand right, Al? May said with a strange combination of sympathy, compassion, and authority, subtly ordering Al to disable the barrier protecting his Byakugan so that she can literally rip it out of its socket with her bare hands, though she would try to be as gentle as she could be about it. Hi Terumi-sama. Al saluted respectfully. Do you have any objections regarding my decision? May asked, not that she was giving him a choice anyway. I have neither objections nor regrets. The benefits of this agreement by far outweigh the loss of my Byakugan. Al replied, very well. May replied as she prepared herself to strike as soon as Al finished the hand seals that would deactivate the barrier. She didn't want him to know when she would strike, because if he did, there was a chance that he might flinch away and cause major damage to himself. She also didn't want to give him a chance to think about it too much, nor did she especially want to give herself a chance to think about it too much, in case either one of them changed their minds. It would be better to allow a medical expert to perform a proper operation, but that would take too long. Even if we didn't change our minds, there's a chance Red Fox could change his mind if he realizes just what a big loss he'd be making from this transaction. May reason trying to justify her actions to herself and therefore soothe her own conscience about what she was about to do to her comrade. Oh 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 The trade has been made successfully, you have your Byakugan, and we have Ron Marukun and the Lightning Fangs. I trust that you will not go back on your word and attempt to get either one of them back, Red Fox San, Al said, now spotting heavy bandaging around his left eye. I will not go back on my word, but you two must not go back on yours. Ranmaru is to become Terumi Dono and Kujiro-san's apprentice, and he is to become the wielder of the Yes yes we get it Red Fox-san, you do not need to keep repeating yourself. We will hold our end of the bargain and I will await the day that you reveal your face to me. May cut in smoothly, the day I reveal my face to you? Naruto asked with a confused frown, though once again it has to be said that no one could see it behind his mask. Surely you don't intend to wear that mask even when you become Hokage do you? That is, if you actually can become the Hokage. May replied tauntingly, No I will remove the mask off course. Becoming Hokage is my calling, 
rest assured that I will become the Hokage, just as I am confident that you will become the Mizukage, and so will Ron Maru after you. Naruto retorted in turn. You have a lot of faith in us don't you? Mei said with a small smile, a smile that Naruto was seeing for the first time on her beautiful face since she arrived. The blonde Uzumaki asking himself why a person with such a beautiful smile didn't smile more often. You should smile more often Terumi Dono, it makes you look even more beautiful than you already are. Red Fox replied, thanks for the compliment, but I'm afraid I don't have a fetish for masked men. Come back when you're just a little older and you no longer feel insecure about your appearance. Mei replied, causing Naruto to sweat drop inside his mask, mainly because he had no idea whether she was joking or not because she kind of seemed serious judging by her tone of voice and facial expression. Um, yeah, I'll think about it. Naruto replied, concluding that the best response was one that matched her own tone and demeanor so as not to offend her, also because he didn't want to tarnish his image by saying something stupid. Anyway, give me my two other gifts that you promised me and get the hell out of here. I don't want to see you again until you visit my office for the Alliance Treaty negotiations, May demanded authoritatively. The blonde Uzumaki once again unrolling a scroll on the ground and releasing another item from the scroll. Is that, the Kubi Karabocho? Kujuro asked in both astonishment and excitement, having never actually seen the blade in person as Zabuza defected long before Kujuro joined the ninja ranks. Yes it is. Naruto replied, Initially, we left this sword in Wave Country and used it as a grave marker for Zabuza and Haku. However, a mere bandit found it and started going around claiming that he had defeated Zabuza, displaying the blade as proof of his victory. When I heard news of this, I immediately went back to Wave Country and reclaimed the sword. The bandit is dead now, I found him chasing down a 14-year-old girl and attempting to rape her, so I mutilated him and took the sword for safekeeping. Nobody outside of this forest knows that I had this sword, I hope it stays that way. Naruto explained as he tossed the executioner's blade towards the bespectacled swordsman subtly ordering that there should be no mentioning of what he had just told them. The ease with which Kujiro caught and held the Kubi Karabocho didn't come as much of a surprise to Naruto, not only because Kujiro wielded a ridiculously huge sword himself, but by mere virtue of the fact that he was a member of the Seven Ninja Swordmen and the fact that the guy had quite a strong chakra for someone of his age. Naruto was around the same age as Kujiro too, but he thought of himself as an exception because of his Jinshiriki status and Uzumaki heritage. These were the thoughts going through the blonde Jinshiriki's mind as Mei's angelic voice once again broke him from his musings. You're too kind Red Fox-san. Giving away so much power to the enemy, this is not how a shinobi should behave. Your compassion and trust in us could be your downfall in the future. You do realize that don't you? Mei asked, showing concern for the blonde Uzumaki, perhaps her true nature easily able to come to the fore now that the trade was practically completed, after all. She was already better off than she was before even if Red Fox rescinded his decision to give unto them the fourth and final gift that he promised them. I know that my behavior is unbefitting of a shinobi, but the truth is, I'm not aiming to be the best shinobi in my generation, or the best shinobi ever for that matter. I'm aiming for something higher, something beyond a shinobi. Naruto retorted. And what pray tell is beyond a shinobi? May asked condescendingly. I don't know, but I'll tell you all about it when I find out. Naruto replied with a bit of mirth causing Mei's face to split up into another one of those angelic smiles of hers. You're really something else you know that Red Fox-san. I bet you'd make a wonderful husband, though I guess it's too early to tell with certainty, especially with that mask in my way, Mei said not so subtly, acting in a manner that was way too forward for Hana's tastes, though she herself failed to understand why that bothered her so much. Stop flirting with the enemy and let's get out of here. Isn't my safe return supposed to be your top priority? Hana spat out with disgust not liking one bit of what was taking place in front of her at all. Okay, we'll leave any time now Hana-san. There's just one more thing okay? Naruto replied hastily. Che. Whatever, just hurry up, Hana said frostily. I wonder why she's so cross with me. Do you have any idea Haku? Naruto asked curiously. I have a few ideas, but I'll let you figure this one out on your own. Haku replied with a tone that was dripping with amusement, much to Naruto's ire as he knew very well that further inquiry was pointless when Haku was acting like this. He'd just have to figure this one out himself, though he'd have to save that for later, Mei's hypnotic voice once again breaking him out of his musings. So Red Fox-san, the other gift you promised to me. I believe you have some important information for me no? Mei asked with more than a little curiosity, in fact practically demanding the information with almost a sense of entitlement. I did make that promise didn't I? Naruto trailed off thoughtfully. Yes you did. And now it's time for you to deliver, Mei said forcefully. Okay then. 
First allow me to explain to you the nature of the information I am about to pass on to you. Everything I am about to tell you is merely theoretical and speculative, but if it works, it has the potential to transform you as a shinobi and take you to a level where you can match a Jinchuriki like Yagura pound for pound in all of his Jinchuriki states with the exception of a full Baiju transformation. If you can't defeat him before he makes the full transformation, then I'm afraid I don't have any further advice for you." Naruto explained clearly and concisely, leaving everyone's eyes wide in surprise, more especially those of Inuzu Kahana, who couldn't help but seriously question where Red Fox, or rather, Naruto's loyalties truly lie right now. However, even she knew better than to cause a scene right now, because if Red Fox truly intended to betray Konoha for Kiri, then Terumi Mei and her henchmen would likely eliminate her if they thought that she might compromise one of their spies. However, perhaps if Hana wasn't so mentally and emotionally exhausted from the Raiga ordeal, she might have realized that Terumi Mei and her henchmen would more likely allow her to live than kill her if they thought that she would expose Red Fox. That is because Red Fox would have no choice but to defect in such a scenario and who else would he run to if such a thing happened other than the people that he seemed to care for so much so much so that he was willing to go to such great extremes to ensure their victory against Yagura, seemingly at the expense of even his own credibility as a loyal Kanaha shinobi. After everything you've already done for us, I'd have to be a fool not to listen to what you have to say at the very least, even if it is only theoretical or speculative. But before you carry on, would you please explain to us what you mean when you say Jinchuriki states? Mei asked, causing Naruto's eyes to widen suddenly inside his mask. You. You guys have yet to fight Yagura or even see him in action have you? Naruto asked in surprise, Mei, Ao, and Kuchiro all surprised that Naruto was able to come to such an accurate conclusion. To say Mei was embarrassed would amount to an incredible understatement, but she knew better than anyone that honesty was the best policy in this situation. You simply don't lie to a doctor about your sickness if you truly want treatment for your ailment. The only way to be cured is to tell the doctor the absolute and complete truth do otherwise at your own peril. That was her policy, and she firmly believed in it and would stick to it even when she was in such a vulnerable position, or rather, especially because she was in such a vulnerable position. You're right. We haven't fought Yagura nor have we seen Yagura in action. He picks and chooses his battles carefully. He never appears on a battlefield with me, Kuchiro, and Rao in it. I only venture to guess, but to me, it seems like his intention is to force us, the ring leaders to watch all of our comrades die until we are the very last one alive. And then finally finish us off. He is saving us for last. May explained, but what about survivors? Weren't they able to give you any information? Naruto inquired. No, there were never any survivors in any battle that Yagura took part in. May replied, wow. Yagura really is one hell of a monster tactician huh, but really I'm more impressed by you. Naruto replied, me? May asked with a confused frown. Yes you silly. I'm not much of a psychologist, but I'm 100% convinced that you have an incredibly strong mental fortitude to have such a confident and stable aura and flow of chakra despite what you must be going through in your life right now. You're an incredible leader Terumi-san. I have no doubts now about choosing you as Ranmaru's mentor. Naruto replied sincerely, though Kuchiro seemed to take offense to those words, said man all of a sudden glaring daggers at the mask to Zamaki causing Naruto to wonder what he could have possibly done or said to offend the young swordsman. Thank you Red Fox-san, but your charms unfortunately won't work on me today. As I said earlier, suspicious masked men aren't exactly my cup of tea, after all, I'm looking for a husband, not a wild fling or one night stand. Mei replied flirtatiously, causing Kujiro to visibly relax, the intense aura around him disappearing all of a sudden, causing Naruto to wonder if he hadn't imagined it to begin with. HN you're one hell of a woman Terumi-san, but you're right, that's not why we're here. Naruto replied, yes, we're here because you have some information for me, don't make me repeat myself again Red Fox-kun, out with it. Mei urged on, this time both Hana and Kujiro narrowing their eyes at the kun suffix and not to mention the more than considerable change in attitude and tone between the two individuals. Okay okay. Here goes. First of all, do you realize that you have the highest chakra vibration frequency out of everyone that traveled with you today? Naruto asked cryptically. I mean no offense in any way whatsoever, but isn't that a rather obvious statement Naruto-san? After all, Terumi-sama is the strongest member of the faction. The molecules of a strong person's chakra tend to vibrate at a higher frequency than normal. Ao replied, higher vibration frequencies doesn't always mean that the opponent is strong though, it could be that the opponent is just fast, or just physically strong or has strong ninjutsu but is physically weak and slow. Naruto retorted, I'm well aware of that, but what does that have to do with anything? 
Ah uh, retorted, he means to say that I am the one whose high chakra vibration frequency denotes only to the strength of my ninjutsu and not my physical brawn and speed, May stated matter-of-factly. I wasn't entirely sure of that, but now that you've confirmed it, I'm even more convinced that you need my information, Naruto declared confidently. Okay, so let me get this straight, to sensor type shinobi, chakra vibration denotes to a person's skill with their chakra. A high chakra vibration could mean that the person has either a high level of skill in ninjutsu, or has a high level of strength or speed. But it can't be that straightforward now can it? What if a person has two of these? Better yet, what if a person has all three in equal abundance? Terumi may ask curiously. That requires an insane amount of chakra. Chakra vibration is only a yardstick to measure a person's skill with chakra, in other words, the speed with which the person's chakra flows. To simplify it further. You could say that chakra vibration is a simply a measure of person's chakra control. Now one can use chakra control to augment his body so as to improve his speed, explosive strength, or ninjutsu, but very few are equally good in all three. Some prefer taijutsu and therefore focus on augmenting their speed and strength, and some like ninjutsu and hence focus on that. Natural talent also plays a part, if you have a natural talent for taijutsu, you'll most likely find it a lot easier to enhance either your speed, strength, or on rare occasions both with your chakra control. Naruto explained patiently, but this is something we already know isn't it? You may have used big words and made it sound more complicated than it is, but everyone knows what you just told us. How does this help me? May asked irritably. You use your high chakra reserves and control to augment your ninjutsu right? Yes and? May drawled out with a bored tone and expression. Well, have you considered using your ninjutsu in turn to augment your speed and strength? In other words, Using your talent for ninjutsu to supplement and complement your taijutsu. Naruto suggested. You mean like the Reikages nin taijutsu? Don't you think Terumi Sama would have done that already if there was a way to do it with her elemental affinities? Ao retorted, really starting to get irritated now as he felt that both their intellect and knowledge was being underestimated. I'm not sure I follow Ao san. What are you insinuating exactly? Red Fox asked curiously. The Reikage uses his rate and affinity to increase the speed of his neural synapses to a level beyond human comprehension, that's how he gains such a vast increase in speed. In what manner can Terumi Sama's affinities do the same for her? Ao asked almost condescendingly. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is Terumi Dono not immune to her own lava and boil release? Because if you weren't, wouldn't the lava burn a hole through your stomach and throat when you spit it out? Wouldn't your boil or steam release melt your body when you release it from your body? Naruto asked rhetorically. Yes but, what does that have to do with anything? What do you have in mind? May asked curiously. If you're immune to boil and lava release, does that not mean that your body can handle extreme levels of heat? And if that's the case, then does that not in turn mean that you can use boil and or lava release to increase the temperature of your body and by extension, the temperature of your chakra? Better yet, could you not just directly increase the temperature of your chakra? Naruto asked in quick succession. Increase the temperature of her chakra? For what good reason would she? Out trailed off, May cutting him off mid-sentence as she came to a sudden realization. Extreme levels of heat cause molecules to vibrate at a higher frequency ow. Do you get it now? If I were to accomplish what Red Fox Kuhn is suggesting, I could exponentially increase the vibration frequencies of my chakra and therefore potentially gain an exponential increase in speed and strength. Actually, now that I think about it, no one else that I know of would be able to survive such a jutsu but me, May said excitedly causing both Kujiro and Ao's eyes to widen in surprise and realization. Exactly. It's worth a shot don't you think? If you get this right, I can almost guarantee that you will be able to match Yaguro pound for pound up to version 2 Jinchuriki state, Naruto said almost excitedly. Red Fox Kun. May trailed off, a dark aura surrounding her finger and a black shadow cast over her yes, causing the feeling of fear and trepidation to rush all over Naruto's body. Wah, huh. Naruto trailed off in surprise. Terumi may all of a sudden jumping him and snaking him into a tight embrace before he could even react, squeezing so tight that he almost suspected that she was maybe trying to suffocate him to death. May san, what are you? Oh, so we're on first name basis now, are we? May asked teasingly. Hey, don't joke around here, that was dangerous, I could have killed you, Naruto said with a serious tone, but you didn't, did you? Could be a big mistake on your part though, because I can literally melt you in the blink of an eye in this position, May whispered into Naruto's ear her hot breath against his ear causing a shiver to run up and down his spine. Then you should probably be made aware that I could literally slice you into a million microscopic pieces of flesh from this position, in an instant. Naruto retorted, a wind style user huh? How interesting, it's no wonder you weren't too reserved about handing over the lightning fangs, after all, 
wind is indeed strong against lightning, May replied, causing Naruto to tense slightly, just now realizing that he had revealed something important about himself that he didn't want to reveal, although he was quick to get over it, after all, it wasn't going to be possible for him to hide basic facts like that for too long anyway, otherwise no one would have known about Hashirama's Mahuten or the Yellow Flash's flying Raijin if it were possible to hide such things indefinitely. Ahem, anyway, I've already wasted too much time with you, I should probably refocus my attentions on the completion of my mission, Naruto said. So you're leaving already? May asked with a surprising tenderness and even, dare he say, vulnerability, May, as far as Naruto could tell clearly unhappy about them going their separate ways so soon. You seemed so eager to get rid of me earlier, even saying that you didn't want to see me until I became Hokage. What could have changed in such a short time? Naruto asked curiously, he and Mei still holding each other in each other's arms. Naruto surprised at how natural this felt considering that they were technically still enemies. Oh I don't know Red Fox Kun, maybe I don't know how to express my gratitude, or maybe I just want to get to know our savior a little more, intimately, Mei said with a sultry tone. As a healthy member of the male species, believe me when I say that I would like nothing more than to get um, close to you, but I've been trained vigorously to deal with seduction techniques. Not even a woman of your goddess-like beauty could seduce me unless I want to be seduced. I might take you if neither of us are taken by the time we become official allies though. Naruto replied, Hey wait a minute, I thought you didn't have a fetish for masked men? Naruto asked, causing Mei to giggle at the expression she imagined was on the blonde Uzumaki's face right now. Well you know sometimes I say a lot of things I don't mean Red Fox Coon, though I did in fact mean that one. Don't take everything so seriously though, I was just teasing. Though now that you've mentioned it, I will consider your offer when we meet again. If I like what I see, then who knows. Mei trailed off as she broke her embrace with the blonde Uzumaki, an accomplished smirk plastered onto her facial features. Um, okay. Naruto replied with a confused tone, unable to help but feel like he had just lost a battle somehow. That's because you did. You've just been head badly, Haku said inside Naruto's mind. The hell is that supposed to mean? Naruto asked defensively, causing Haku to laugh out loud at the blonde Uzumaki's expense. Can't you see? She made a move on you but when she untangled herself from you, she turned the situation around and got you to make a move on her. Now it looks like you're the one that wants to hit it off with her if the situation is right in the future. Haku explained, what the hell are you talking about? I don't really get it. Naruto retorted with a mental frown, causing Haku to sigh in exasperation. You're not even half as bad as you were about a year ago, but you still have a long way to go when it comes to women. I guess this just doesn't come as easy as ninjutsu does to you. Anyway it doesn't matter, I'll explain everything properly when we get home. Right now you should probably focus on your mission. We're done here, and um, Naruto. Haku trailed off with a nostalgic expression. What is it bro? Naruto asked curiously. Thank you. For what? Naruto asked with a confused expression. Well, as far as mental expressions go anyway. For keeping your promise to help end the bloodline purges in Kiri, and for honoring mine and Zabuza-sama's memory. Haku replied earnestly. Oh, well um, I'm sure you would have done the same for me right? Naruto retorted with a metal smile and thumbs up. Yeah, that goes without saying. Haku replied with a serene smile. Isn't it about time we leave now? I'm not as comfortable as you seem to be around our enemies, Hana said feistily, breaking Naruto out of his short trance in the process. Yes, it is just about time we get going, Naruto said as he shunshined behind Hana, pulling her into a tight embrace from behind, almost as if holding onto a lover. W what the hell are you doing? Hana stuttered, a flustered expression adorning her facial features. Naruto however did not respond immediately. Instead the blonde Uzumaki creating three more shadow clones, each shadow clone picking up and carrying one of the Ninkan in their arms. We're going to use the skies to make our way. It will be easier to pass the border without detection if we use this method and it will also be quicker. Naruto explained calmly. Why you can't be serious? You mean to tell me that you can FL? Hana trailed off in shock, a surge of chakra surrounding the duo as they levitated towards the sky, not only Hana but everyone, including the Ninkan. Unable to believe what they were seeing and experiencing respectively. Sugoi. What is this aura that's surrounding us? Is it Naruto kun's wind style or something else? Hana pondered with an astonished but also impressed expression. This is my wind style, air subjugation technique, and as you can see, it is an ability that enables me to conquer the skies. We'll arrive in Konoha in no time at all if we travel in this manner. Naruto explained. I, I see. Hana trailed off, 
still completely stunned by the sudden turn of events and not to mention flustered the close and borderline intimate contact that she and Naruto were making at that moment, even though it was unintentional. Why the hell do I feel like this, like I could easily submit to him? He's just a kid for Kami-sama's sake, and he's Kiba's friend too. Hana thought irritably. A shinobi that can fly, this is unbelievable. Al thought out loud. Indeed. The only other shinobi I know of that can pull something like that off is the San Daimate Tsuchika Jonoki. May retorted, also spotting an odd expression as was every one of his comrades. Until we meet again Mei-san, Ranmaru. Naruto trailed off with a genuine smile, not that it could be seen behind the fox mask he was spotting. Goodbye, Red Fox Nisan. I hope to see you again soon and I promise to make you proud, Ranmaru exclaimed elatedly, waving his arms excitedly at the blonde Uzumaki. Until we meet again. May replied, also waving goodbye at the blonde Uzumaki. Having said his goodbyes, Naruto decided it was time for them to depart, the fox-masked Hunanin and his clones literally jetting off in the direction of Konoha at such a speed that a mini whirlwind formed in their wake, causing Mei and the others to cover their eyes with their arms to protect themselves from the wind. Sugoi. Naruto Nisan is such a powerful and amazing shinobi, I'm going to become just like him. When does my training start Terumi-sama, Kuchuro-sensei? Ranmaru asked enthusiastically. As soon as we're done interrogating you. Mei replied with a sinister smirk. W what? A shocked Ranmaru stuttered, his mind immediately taking back to the brutal interrogation that Naruto had put Raiga through, unable to quite imagine himself going through the same thing. Oh come on now Ranmaru-chan don't look at me like that, I don't want to do this to you, I really don't. But. I carry the weight of thousands of lives on my shoulders, I can't afford to slack off. I have to make sure that yours and Red Fox's intentions are pure. You understand right? May asked with a smile and tone that was way too friendly given the dangerous aura that was coming from her, Ranmaru swallowing a huge gulp as he mentally cursed Naruto for leaving him at the mercy of this crazy woman. Oh 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 What is this place? I thought you said you were taking me back to Konoha. Hana asked suspiciously. I was given ten days to bring you back. Six days of traveling, in other words three days to go to Kiri and three days to go back to Konoha, and then four days to find you in Raiga, defeat Raiga, and rescue you. However, it's only been six days now since I departed from Konoha. I figured we could use the remaining four days to just relax and enjoy ourselves, plus, we both need a bath and a change of clothes, and we need to talk about what happened in Kiri before we go back to Konoha. Naruto explained patiently. So that's why you took me to this, holiday resort? Hana asked. It's a new place, they only opened about two weeks ago. No one will disturb us here, not many shinobi come to new places like this for a while, most shinobi prefer environments and routes that they are already familiar with. Naruto further explained, I see, so um, are you planning to kill me? Hana asked bluntly, W what? No way. You're Kiba's sister, and I promised your mother I'd bring you back safely, why would I kill you? Naruto asked in surprise, caught completely off guard by Hana's question. Then why did you take me to an isolated place that has no shinobi? And why do you want to talk about what happened to Kiri? It makes me think that you don't want me to tell Goddaim Sama what you did in Kiri, and that you'll kill me if I don't agree to keep your secret. Hana pressed on. You're very perceptive Hana-san. So it's true, you want to kill me? Hana asked with a dangerous tone. Hell no, Naruto exclaimed uncharacteristically. I mean, no, I have no intention of killing you Hana-san. It's true that I want you to leave out some stuff about what happened in Kiri. But if you don't want to keep my secret then I'll just have to face the consequences. I'd never kill you over something silly like that. Naruto retorted, Hana giving him an intense searching look before finally relaxing. Okay, I believe you. You do? Naruto asked hopefully. Yes I do, but I still don't get why you wanted such a secluded area. Hana argued stubbornly. To minimize threat levels and also because I don't want to run into other shinobi from the village. I'm supposed to be on a long term mission in demon country you know. Naruto replied, that doesn't make sense, you have a mask that is x-ray vision proof and you don't have a scent. How would anyone know that they ran into you? A chakra sensor who knows my chakra signature would know, and even a Byakugan user who understands a Jinchuriki's chakra network might be able to know it's me even without seeing my face. I'm still working on a seal that will cloak my chakra signature but I haven't completed it yet. Naruto explained, okay but don't you already have an x-ray proof seal? Why can't you just place it on your Anbu cloak and that way even a Hyuga won't be able to tell that you're a Jinchuriki? Hmm, you know, that's actually a good idea, why didn't I think of that? Naruto trailed off with a thoughtful expression, because you're an idiot. I mean it's so obvious. Hana retorted irritably. Not really, 
I didn't know that the Byakugan could differentiate between Jinchuriki and normal people until we encountered Ao, so I couldn't have thought of that until recently. Anyway all of it is irrelevant because I don't want to wear my Anbu outfit here, I want to be just me, Uzumaki Naruto for the next 4 days, so I won't be wearing my x-ray proof mask out here. That's the main reason why I chose this place. Why don't you want to wear your uniform? Hana asked with a confused expression. Because I want you to get to know Uzumaki Naruto, not Red Fox. If I'm going to be asking such a big favor from you, then I believe that I have to show you the real me so that you can judge for yourself if I am worth the risk or not. Having said however, I don't want you to feel pressured into anything, I won't hold it against you if you refuse, I'll still respect you and care about you regardless, as long as you are honest and true to yourself. Naruto replied sincerely. You, you care about me? Hana asked with a light blush. Well, yeah I mean, you're my friend's sister, and a fellow Konoha shinobi. Of course I care about you. What kind of Hokage would I be if I didn't? Naruto replied ignorantly, Haku slamming his head against his forehead at Naruto's response as he saw the disappointed look that appeared briefly on Hana's face, something that Naruto also didn't fail to notice, though unlike Haku, he wasn't exactly sure why it had appeared. Why do I feel this way, do I actually wish that I meant more to him than just a sister of his friend and a fellow Konoha shinobi? Hana pondered, confused by her own feelings as even she couldn't come up with an answer to her predicament. No. There's no way I have romantic feelings for him. He's four years younger than me for Kami-sama's sake. Maybe I just wish that he considered me as a friend after everything we've gone through, or maybe I'm just feeling vulnerable because of what that bastard Raiga put me through. I'm sure I'll get over it in no time at all, Hana thought, trying to master some conviction though not really able to fully convince herself. Ahem anyway, maybe we should check in? Naruto suggested, breaking Hana out of her trance-like state in the process. Yeah maybe we sh. What the? Hana trailed off in surprise, her eyes catching something completely different from what she had become accustomed to recently. No longer was Naruto wearing a long white cloak and no longer was he wearing a fox mask or anbu armor. He was now wearing the standard Konoha Jonin outfit complete with a green flak jacket, black metal plated gloves and a gigantic sword on his back wrapped with a large white bandage, a large black seal visible on the black bandages too. W and did you change into that, and where did the sword come from? Hana stuttered still completely shocked by the fact that naruto had managed to change his outfit without her noticing even though he was standing right in front of her you kinda zoned out for a while there so i figured you must have been thinking deeply about something important i decided not to disturb you and use the time to change into something more comfortable it happened in an instant all i did was unsummon the clothing i was wearing and then i summoned this new set of gear it's a very useful few in jutsu i could teach it to you if you'd like naruto replied with a kind-hearted smile um thanks naruto kun but I'm tired right now, I just need some rest. Maybe later, tomorrow perhaps? Hana replied, unable to take her eyes off of the blonde Uzumaki's handsome features. Sure no problem, let's check in, get a bath, and then call it day. It's almost dark anyway. Naruto ordered, the blonde Uzumaki not waiting for a response as he walked ahead of Hana, Kamiko however quickly catching up and walking next to the young Hunanen, her tail wagging left to right excitedly. Hey Naruto! Hana called out as she, Kazuko, and Kimiko quickly caught up. Yes Hana-san? Naruto asked. How the hell is carrying that gigantic thing on your back more comfortable to you compared to your Anbu gear? Hana asked incredulously, Naruto chuckling amusedly at her hardcore tone and accent, something he thought he could never get tired of hearing. This sword doesn't weigh even a quarter of the weight you're probably imagining. Naruto explained. Naruto that's, that's bullshit, Hana said matter-of-factly causing Naruto to try but fail to hold back his laughter. W what's so funny? Hana asked irritably. Nah it's nothing, he he he, I just like you a lot that's all. You and I could be good friends you know, well, at least I wouldn't mind if we were to become friends. Naruto replied with complete honesty and sincerity. Why you mean, you wanna be friends with me? Hey wait a minute, you're not just saying that because you want me to keep some secrets for you about what happened in Kiri are you? Hana asked with a suspicious glare. I understand your concerns, but as I said before, your decision will not change how I feel about you, I won't hold anything against someone who stands by their convictions and is true to themselves. The only people I dislike are those who lie to themselves. Naruto replied with a serious expression, Hana realizing in that moment there were no lies or deception coming from the blonde Uzumaki, that he truly meant and believed in what he was saying. HN, I bet Kiba will be pissed off at me for stealing his friend from him. I can't wait to see the expression on his face when he finds out. Hana laughed mischievously, showing a side that Naruto had yet to see from her, 
but one that he absolutely adored as a former trickster and prankster himself. So um, does that mean that you and I are friends now? Naruto asked nervously, wondering in his mind just what the hell he was nervous about to begin with, it wasn't like he was asking her out or anything like that. Yes, I accept you as my friend Naruto-kun, but only after you tell me more about that mysterious sword on your back. Hana retorted with a playful smirk. He he he. I guess I have no choice then. There's not much to tell though, this is basically the Raijin no Ken that used to belong to the Nidaim Hokage. Naruto explained, causing Hana's eyes to widen in surprise. And no way. There's no doubt that the hilt looks exactly the same, but as far as I'm aware, that sword has no blade, it is just that, a hilt. A blade made of pure lightning appears only when you cannot chakra into the hilt, and it requires a lot of chakra to manifest a katana-sized blade much less gigantic cleaver like yours seems to have. Hana argued vehemently. You're well informed Hana-san. Just Hana or Hana-chan thank you, we're friends now aren't we? Hana asked rhetorically causing a small smile to appear on Naruto's facial features. Of course, Hanachan it is then Naruto replied, causing Hana to smile back at him, a smile that had Naruto literally weak in the knees, barely able to catch himself before he could hit the dirt and embarrass himself. Ahem. To answer your question, nothing that you said was incorrect. However, you have to understand that a weapon is only as strong as its wielder. This sword was damaged beyond repair almost two years ago by Sasuke's Chidori and my Rasengan. Aname missing nin known as Aoi had somehow gotten his hands on the sword and was our enemy during one of our missions. He thought that simply owning the sword made him invincible, and that was his mistake, a mistake that led to his defeat. Naruto explained, taking a short pause to allow the info to sink in before carrying on from where he left off. When we returned from the mission, Godaim Sama tried to get the sword fixed, but no one could pull it off, including Jiraiya Sensei and Godaim Sama herself. So she gave it to me as a trophy or a keepsake for defeating a user of the sword, she said I had earned it. I vowed to myself from that moment on that I would one day fix the sword and rule the world with it, he he he, I remember how foolish she thought I was and how much both she and Sensei laughed at me. In the end I wasn't only able to fix it, I was also able to modify it and make it an exponentially more powerful weapon. That's why it looks different from what you remember. Naruto explained, W wow, you're so different from what I remember of you, I mean, you're still Naruto I guess, but so much more. I know we've never been close before but I'd like to think I knew you better than most shinobi in the village, you were my brother's friend after all, and there's the time we visited you in the hospital and I sewed your pants, Hana said with a nostalgic expression. Do you prefer the old Naruto or this one? Naruto asked curiously. No offense to the old Naruto, but this Naruto is mature, handsome, and reliable, not to mention that he totally saved my life. Yeah, I definitely prefer this Naruto. Hana retorted with a lovely smile, Naruto's heart slowly but surely melting the more time he spent with her, and he didn't like that all, despite how good it felt. He he he. Well, I also prefer the current Naruto just so you know. Naruto retorted, the two laughing together as they finally reached the large gates of the resort, a strong camaraderie and sense of trust developing between the two young ninjas. Four days later, on Buu headquarters. So let me get this straight. You had in your possession a healthy young boy with a bloodline limit that emulates both the Hyuga and Uchiha's visual prowess and you thought it was okay to just hand him over to a potential enemy? Bor asked incredulously, unable to believe what he had just heard from the person he thought of as his most skilled and professional subordinate, he would definitely have to reevaluate his opinion after what he just heard though. He was seated on his office desk with his hands locked together in front of him, the god I'm Hokage, Senju Tsunade standing beside him on his left hand side along with Shizune who was carrying Tantan in her arms as usual. On his right hand side stood Inuzu Katsume, who didn't seem to give a damn about anything else besides the fact that her daughter had been safely returned to her, the result being a weak attempt at looking displeased at the two pups standing in front of them side by side across the desk, Hana's Ninkan almost acting as bodyguards the way that they stood around the duo. I mean no disrespect poor Taiku, but need I remind you of our shinobi code? The mission takes priority over anything and everything else and my mission was ensuring Inusu Kahana's safe return to the village. I couldn't afford to do anything that would jeopardize that. Red Fox replied robotically. It's good to know that you have memorized your shinobi code Red Fox, but simply memorizing the code and applying it are two different things. Yes it's true that the mission takes priority, but is it also not true to our code that the life of one comrade is not worth the lives of many? What if this boy becomes a threat to us in the future? What if he kills many of our comrades? Can you guarantee that he won't do that given the fact that you killed his only precious person? Can you guarantee he won't succumb to his hate just as Uchiha Sasuke did? 
Tsunade asked rhetorically. That's the end guys if you enjoyed then make sure to leave a comment this is Chaos Shinobi signing off.